Hello, and welcome to Jason Cabinets Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cabinets. I'm also the CEO founder of Cabinets HR. At Cabinets HR, we provide HR to companies for 49 or fewer people. Our guest today is Shelly. I'm going to let him introduce his own name because I don't want to like, mess it up right. So can you introduce yourself real fast? Yes. Hello, everybody. My name is Shalendra Pratap Jain. I'm a professor of marketing and international business at the Foster School at University of Washington. Really happy to be here. And how long have you been a professor there? At the Foster School, I've been there for about 16 years. Since graduating from New York University's PhD program, I have been in the academia for about 30 years. Okay. Um, so we do a deep dive of all the great things you're doing. But first, I like to ask, ask people this question, like, what do you do for fun, your hobbies? Like, how do you take care of yourself? All that kind of stuff, so to speak. So my wife and I love to travel. We like food a lot. We also love watching movies and series. Uh, I read a bit. And uh, we now relax at home, which is part of our joy and just chilling out. We have a daughter who's going to the Tisch School at NYU. So they keep us busy quite a bit. And that's a lot of fun as well. So what's the last place y'all went to as far as traveling? The last place we went to some year, well, last year was India. Okay. So my wife's parents are quite old. They're in their 90s. And it was kind of an annual pilgrimage for us. We have our family and friends in India. And it was a delightful trip. Absolutely terrific. So how long is that trip? Like seven days or something? <laughs> well, it depends on the kind of flight you take. But we look at flights which are typically between 21 and 24 hours one way. Okay. Is that you did? Is it a direct flight you do? Or? No, there is no direct flight direct from flight. Seattle. Okay. There is a direct flight from Toronto, from Newark, from Chicago. A direct flight is typically 14, 15 hours long, okay. which tends to get a little tiring and physically demanding. So what we tend to do is we take a stop somewhere in Europe, maybe London, you Frankfurt. Stay, stay like two or three days or something? No, we do not. Okay. The hop, the, the stop in these uh, uh, European cities is three to four hours. Okay. It gives us a little break. So no mini vacation? No mini vacation. for, for We haven't done a mini vacation for quite some time. Okay. Yeah. And were you uh, originally born in India? Yes. Okay. I was born in India several years back. And I came to the States in 1990 okay. to do a PhD at NYU at the Stern School. Okay. And so did NYU recruit you to come to school there or you applied there? I applied okay. and then they accepted my application. Okay. Uh, I have to guess it's a pretty competitive process. I, I would imagine it's competitive because most PhD admissions, um, PhD programs, you know, they have specific uh, criteria that they look for. And uh, uh, to give you an example, at our school, we get about 100 applications every year. And we admit a maximum of two or three in a very rare year do we admit four people. So that is the current acceptance rate at our school. I would imagine at schools like NYU, Columbia, you're looking at similar kind of acceptance rates. Could be lower, could be higher. Let me ask you this. Like, in the United States, it's like there's always like this um, thing that all public schools are like below par, substandard. We're not producing great students. But I have a comma, all these great, all this great talent from overseas comes to our colleges, right? So you think it's a, it like it's a disconnect, right? Any reason why you think that is? Uh, the disconnect between the quality of the school and quality of the people? Yeah, as far as like, you know, United States, we always complain about public schools. We're like, we're behind the world and all this stuff, you know. We are all the world's best students want to come to our college. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I think um, the United States education is considered to be a benchmark globally. It's a, stand it's a very, very high standard. So when we live in the United States, we tend to be a little self-critical which is a good thing if the quality gets improved in the process. But the world outside is calibrated very differently. They believe that even an average school in the U.S. is probably better than most of the schools that they have access to in their countries. Uh, regarding public schools, you know, there are lots of public schools in the U.S. that are close to being as good as private schools, if not better. So there is a separate ranking of public universities, separate ranking of private universities, and overall, there's a ranking. So a number of public universities routinely feature in the top 15, 20, 30 universities in the U.S. For instance, uh, Michigan, UCLA, University of Washington, Indiana University, these are all public universities, and they are considered to be top of the heap in terms of the kind of students they admit, the kind of students they graduate, the kind of research that they're doing, and how they're changing the world. Yeah, I don't think people realize that University of Washington has one of the top business schools, one of the top computer science schools. Yeah, yeah. One of the top human design schools, you know. And yeah. I, I don't think a lot of people realize that. Yeah, people, University of Washington, in my opinion, is still a best kept secret 
not just in the world, but even in the US, even yeah. locally, yeah. you know, you find people are not aware and could be one of the reasons is so many universities have the word Washington in their title. University of Washington, George Washington University, yeah, right. Washington State University, yeah. Washington University, St. Louis. Yeah. So there is a bit of probably a brand confusion, but UW, as we call it fondly, is absolutely the top of the heap as a university. So <clears throat> this might be an ignorant, ignorant question, but is education in the United States the same as education in India? It's like basically like you get them from a classroom, you teach kids like different problems and stuff, how to solve them. Or is it different? Well, I would say that if you were to do a categorization of, let's say, the top schools in India that I have taught at, I've taught at a few good schools in India. And if you were to do a similar kind of categorization in the United States, I think you probably find they're comparable to a large extent, but the median quality might be varied depending on the country you're talking about. I think the world's perception is that the US median quality is higher than the median quality of most countries on the planet. So that's my best answer to your question. But there are some great schools in India and there are some, you know, not great schools. And likewise, in the US, there is a pecking order in terms of quality perceptions. What are the other places in the US have traveled to? Oh, in the US? Oh, God, that's a lot. US or overseas? Okay. Anywhere. So I've traveled quite a bit in the US, um, probably about 10 or 15 states. I'm just guessing here, California, Colorado, uh, Texas, Arizona, New York, Connecticut, you know, uh, Indiana, that's where I was before. We moved to Washington, Washington State, and Illinois, uh, Tennessee, quite a few states, okay. Virginia. Do you have any like favorite places you've been to before? So in terms of cities, I would say my favorite cities that I have at this point in time are three. And I'm not being biased here, but one is Seattle. I, I never realized Seattle could be such a beautiful and livable city when we moved here. The other one is Boston. I love Boston. And the third is San Francisco. Okay. Of course, San Francisco, there are lots of bad press right now I about mean, what Seattle is going too, through. Right? Yeah, Seattle too. Yeah, yeah, I agree with you. But these are my three favorite cities in the United States. Uh, globally, we've been to Norway. That's one place. That's on my bucket list. I haven't been there yet. Norway's on my bucket list. I, I think you should yet. go there, Jason. We did a cruise there and it was we lucked out in terms of the cruise. Many people want to go to Alaska cruise yeah. or, you know, Hawaii. And those are probably great cruises as well. But this was a real gem that we discovered. We did the sit, the country, Norway, from uh, west to east around the, the boundaries of the country. And we saw lots of beautiful places. And it is just a delightful country. Were you able to see the northern lights on the cruise? No, we did not. Okay, man, that would be fantastic. <laughs> that would be great. So here's one thing that I didn't realize till maybe a couple years ago. Like, people don't realize how far north Seattle is. Like, I didn't realize, like, two years ago, like, Seattle's actually farther north than Boston. Like, yeah. I had no clue. Like, I thought, Boston, there's no way. But yeah, we're like... Yeah, we're right up there. there. We're right up there. So we are very close to Vancouver. Mm -hmm. And we've driven on that sea to sky highway uh -huh. from Seattle to Vancouver to Whistler. Some delightful experiences in life we've had. So do you have a bucket list place to go to next? Well, one of them is Greece. Greece. We want to do Greece. My wife wants to do Scotland. Okay. And um, we also want to do uh, Iceland. Oh, wow. Okay. And one of my, you know, bucket list places is Galapagos Islands. Oh, wow. I yeah. learned about that when I was a kid. And I heard about Darwin and, you know, all the kind of good things that are going on by way of biology and research and evolution. I really want to go there. So, you know, most Americans are ignorant about across the world, right? What's the, some things about India that you think uh, uh, average Americans should know about? Or maybe a stereotype about India that's not true or maybe is true? Well, I think the stereotypes are there for a reason. Uh, many stereotypes are probably based on some biased or incomplete perceptions. I agree there. But many stereotypes exist because there is some data to support that stereotype. So having said that, I think there is a stereotype that India is a poor country. Those That was an accurate stereotype 40, 50, 60 years back. Today... India is not a poor country as we define poverty in, in terms of below poverty line. At one point in time, 60 to 70 percent of the population was below what was traditionally considered a poverty line. Today, it's no more than 30 percent. So the country has developed economically, industrially. There's a lot of, you know, jostling for the sunshine on the global stage that is going on. And uh, it's a very important country from a global policy perspective for U.S. and for most of the other you know, developed countries. They're trying to build a relationship with India. It's also a lot in the news because of some political tensions. You know, India is surrounded by 
neighbors where there's some unrest that is going on. And India comes in news partly because of that. And then the whole world has this very strong conservative movement that is taking place in many, many parts of the world. And that's happening in India as well. So uh, India is now, uh, gender equality has increased a lot. Uh, there's a lot of self-esteem which is building up in India. It got independence in 1947, which is about 77, 78 years back. And the country has gone through its low self-esteem phase after the British left. And now it is really increasing in self-esteem, self-awareness. People are speaking up a lot. People are not scared. People are not driven by certain policies that were given to the country. They want to have their own say. So all those changes are taking place in the country. Is the caste system still a thing over there? That's where it's all, all gone now. Yeah, I don't think it's gone. I don't think it's, it's gone. But there yeah, somewhere. yeah, it is there in some parts of the country. It's not as salient or as consequential in terms of how we live our lives in India, but it is there in some parts. Okay. And in the cities, I think it is less and less of significance or as a criterion for deciding how to and when to interact with people. In some villages and rural areas, I would imagine there is still the caste system at work. Okay. And is Gandhi still like still like a like a superhero, so to speak, over India? Like he's still kind of worship as a national hero? Yeah, I would say that a vast a vast segment of the country's population still considers Mahatma Gandhi as what we call the father of the nation. Okay. Of course, you know, after as we become more and more curious, inquisitive, we start digging and digging and digging. And some more information appears, like in the life of everybody. Yeah, stuff comes up. Stuff you know, comes out. No one's perfect. You that's know, right. That's right. Stuff they did. That's right. So partly that phenomenon is occurring, and partly I think there are very strong viewpoints that are emerging in the country about the manner in which Gandhi helped India come out of British rule, and whether he was responsible, who else was responsible, who got the credit, who didn't the credit, who didn't get the credit. So all those theories are emerging. And I think there's a lot of moving and shaking going on. How you know the truth? That's what happened almost 80 years ago, right? Yeah, I think the truth will ultimately, as in anything, truth is oftentimes seen through the eyes of the truth maker. You know, and it depends on how curious we are, how willing we are to challenge the truth versus just swallowing whatever we are given. Uh, one segment of the country has uh, strong triggers about the history as we were taught in our schools while we were growing up. And now we are discovering that the history was probably not accurate in its uh, demonstration of what were the powers that be and how India go, got to where it was. So I, this is a good thing. It's a good thing, you know, information is emerging and the country is becoming more informed, smarter, wiser, and more critical about its own existence, existence as well as that of the world. So I have this theory as far as history, like back in the 20s or 30s, I think it was the British, they made up all these borders, right? Like the Middle Eastern borders, you know, all they all the stuff they did wrong, right? Like India, Pakistan, around the borders, right? I just think so much blame should be blamed on the British, right? So what do you think about that? Yeah, and, you know, like in every country, there are people who do the people who don't. So uh, British ruled India for quite a long time. And uh, there is emerging information that some good things were done, some not so good things were done. Like in colonial rule, lots of things were done which were not appropriate and so on and so forth. And... Uh, uh, having said that, you know, they left behind an education system, which I'm benefiting from, to be perfectly honest. They build the railways for whatever reason, they build the railways for their own commerce, but the country is benefiting from it. Uh, there are hypothetical questions. Could India have done this without Britain? Did we really need the British education system? Did we need the English language? Look at Japan, look at China. They operate without the English language and so on and so forth. So, yeah, those are interesting questions. Those are, you know, devil's advocate kind of moments which we should engage in. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, you know, there were some good things done that were not some good things done. And um, we will have history rewritten in some ways. Uh, and uh, now we need to write our own stories, Jason. Otherwise, somebody will else write for them, for us. And I think that is where India is today, where it's writing its own stories. And the younger generation today, the Gen Z, as we call them, are completely not accepting the history and the truth not, as no. we knew it, They're most not. of them yeah. in the urban areas. They are they are discovering their own lives. They are very opinionated. They're very independent, self-determining, spunky. And they don't know what it was like to be ruled by the British and the Mughal kings. They have no clue. You know, They have no connection with it. My parents did. 
I did to some extent. Now these kids are probably yeah. in a very different world. So I think the country is going through that metamorphosis very naturally and organically. So one thing I do want to see is like, you know, on the border of India and Pakistan, that one area where it's kind of like, you know, under like, um, like disputed, and they do like this, this guard ceremony thing every day. Yeah. That's something I do want to do. I've seen all the videos and stuff. Like, yeah. I think that'd be pretty like cool to see, like, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it, it has been featured in some Bollywood movies. So that could be, you know, a little, of a, little sliver of a, an image if you think you might want to check it out. Yeah. Otherwise, yes, I think it's a fascinating moment where soldiers from Pakistan on yeah. one side, soldiers from India on the yeah. other side, and they are, you know, doing their own thing. Yeah. Um, and so one thing, just my opinion, I think India does a good job. Maybe they don't like, it's like they're, they're trying to balance between an ally. It's like sometimes they play the United States against like Russia and China sometimes, right? Because you see India come over here, there's our president, and then a few months later, of course, I'm making this up a little bit. Then they have like the premier of Russia and China over there, you know? So it's almost like they're playing both hands sometimes, yeah, yeah. you know? Yeah, I, I, I don't know precisely the situation. Let me tell you my observation. Uh, India has was in the in the about 40, 50 years back, India was very strongly aligned with what was called USSR, you know, which today is called Russia. At least the, the breakaway country is called Russia. So we were very strongly aligned with the USSR, and that created some tensions with the United States in terms of diplomacy and political relations. Uh, today, India calls itself non-aligned which means that they have pretty much said in so many words that we are not aligned with a specific country in terms of our preferences and our political inclinations. We want to take care of ourselves, our people, and in the process, we will approach whichever country would like to work with us, saying this is how we can help each other, and whichever country agrees, we will work with them. I think that is India's stand in my understanding. Uh, in the last 20 years or so, if I'm not mistaken, India and US have come very, very close in part because of USSR splitting up. You know, it doesn't exist any longer. Uh, having said that, yes, India and Russia still have collaborations, as do India and US. With China, there are some tensions right now because of some border s issues. Yeah, China's like trying to push everyone on. Like, you're some news alert. Like, I think a couple of weeks ago, they ran over like a Filipino naval ship. Yeah. They built islands somewhere else. Then it's like, it's like China's like trying to like, lack of a better term, punk and bully all the little small countries there. Yeah. China and India have had some tensions in the last few years. And uh, India believes that's the, what we read in the media, that China is encroaching on India's territory. And uh, we that's all we read. Yeah. We don't read anything else. And India has pushed back. So I don't know how strongly aligned or collaboration buys we are with China. I don't know that yeah. precisely. Uh, yes, we get, we eat Chinese food, you know, we see movies <laughs> and, you know, yeah. many people like Chinese culture for all kinds of reasons. I've been to Shanghai a few times and I really enjoyed my time there. I didn't have any issues at all, so to speak. But I don't really know the deeper aspects of political collaboration that is going on between China and India. I What we do learn is that China and U.S. are coming very, uh, sorry, India and U.S. are coming very close. Yeah. Biden met the Indian Prime Minister, Modi, and Trump has met, when he was the president, yeah. Trump has met Modi. When Bill Clinton was the president and Hillary Clinton was, you know, in the in the administration of the government, they met Indian leaders. So they have met the Indian people quite closely and they know each other very well. Uh, Barack Obama also was quite, uh, you know, um, well connected with the Indian leaders. So I think U.S. is trying to build a bridge with India because of its strategic location. Uh, you know, with Pakistan on one side, yeah. China on the other, and also because of India's growing economic strength and power. Yeah, I think what people don't realize, maybe they do, like a lot of big time U.S. tech companies are led by, you know, Indian CEOs, like uh, the guy Microsoft, the guy at Google. Mm -hmm. I'm sure I'm missing some other big time tech mm -hmm. companies. You Amazon, know, yeah. Amazon, yeah. yeah. Yeah, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, all these are very strongly connected with India. You know, a large part of the software talent in the U.S. is from India. So, and the country recognizes it. U.S. recognizes it really well. And uh, so, um, well, yeah, that's one, one manifestation yeah. of the connection between India and U.S. And uh, Bill Gates, uh, Jeff Bezos, when he was heading Amazon, and Satya Nadella is from India, who's the CEO of Microsoft. Yeah. Uh, so these people are very well connected in India, and India and uh, U.S. have even strong, uh, building a stronger economic relations. Why do you think India became such a big tech hub for the United States? You know, that's an interesting question. I don't have a precise answer for it. My guess is, so I started seeing this 
uh, technology talent blooming in India when I was doing my MBA, which is 40 years back. And there was a lot of talent which was being exported to the United States, uh, the tech talent that we are talking about. So I suspect that, you know, it was, it was an opportunity. Somebody said, let me check it out, like a lot of human discoveries. It was an experiment and it started gaining traction. And before you knew it, it became a tsunami of sorts. Yeah. And all of a sudden, India became this, you know, hunting ground for tech yeah. talent. Yeah, for, I, don't know if, I don't know if this happened organically or like some of the government kind of like personal it, levels, you know. It could be. It could be. It could be that the government was pushing it. It's possible. Uh, and having said that, I would imagine to be able to see that there is this enormous ocean mm. of an opportunity in the tech domain requires a visionary like no other 50 years back, yeah. you know? So yes, some of it has been supported with government incentives, for sure, the government supports it. And also as India's talent got more and more foothold in the US, the Indian tech companies started coming to the US yeah. and supporting the tech giants of the US. For instance, there are companies in the U in India which are doing consulting for companies like Microsoft, Amazon, and Google, and so on. So. It became, now it's become a massive enterprise. Definitely. So let me ask you this, right? So in the U.S. news, you always hear about, you know, United States, Russia, nuclear weapons, you know, World War III is coming. But in your part of the world, it's India, Pakistan, China, Russia, all next to each other, all with nuclear weapons, right? They all have nuclear weapons. Does that, does that affect how y'all live over there? It's like over your head all the time. I hear the United States always hearing like, oh, Russia has all these thousands of nuclear weapons, all this kind of stuff. Is it like the same there with four nuclear capable company, countries in the same area? Yeah, I don't know whether it is hanging like a sword on the top, on the head of the Indian people on a day-to-day -day basis. I would imagine that the policymakers are highly sensitive to this development and this situation, I would imagine. The ordinary person on the street has too many other things to worry about. And so they are trying to make a life for themselves and their family. So I don't know how salient this issue is for them and how sensitive they are to it. So that's what I have to say specific to your question. It's not like we are having sleepless nights or we are dealing with clinical. We're not doing drills like we did back in the 50s here, nothing like that. Well, I would imagine that the country's army and the naval forces, yeah, and the, forces. They, they will be doing drills. Yeah. They are being prepared for all kinds of eventualities, I would imagine. That's certainly happening. But uh, the drills for the ordinary person on the roads, I haven't heard of them okay. for a very, very, very yeah, long time. Here, yeah, yeah. yeah. So... I realize this might be an impossible question to answer. Like, so if someone has asked me, hey, Jason, what should you visit in the United States? I'd be like, are you kidding me, right? So I haven't said that. <laughs> if I was going to India, what's like some two or three things you would say, hey, Jason, you need to go visit these things? So if you want to know the places to visit, I think there are obviously more than two or three, as you can imagine. There are some amazing architectural marvels and wonders in India, which have been uh, handed down to us literally thousands of years back. Uh, then, you know, the usual tourist yeah. trap is the Taj Mahal. Yeah. Yeah. And Taj Mahal is uh, considered to be the monument for of love, so to speak, because it was made by an emperor for his wife. Uh, I've been there two, three times, and there is no doubt it is just a spectacular piece of architecture. Uh, and there are lots of, lots of, you know, forts. Uh, those are beautiful to look at. And all over the country, there's no specific part of the country that I can earmark for you because I have traveled quite a bit in yeah. India. And then there are some gorgeous beaches and, uh, you know, forests in India. Wildlife is wonderful in India. And uh, if you are a foodie, I think India is probably going to give a hugely diverse cuisine mix all over the country. There are just amazing things to discover as far as food is concerned. Uh, you have to be careful. You have to eat at the right place. Yeah. Just like in the U.S. or anywhere yeah. else, you have yeah. to eat the right place. You have to be careful. Yeah. And uh, those are some of the things I will really encourage you to do. Don't go to India, if you will, for a week. Yeah. I think go there for a long enough time. And uh, my favorite thing when I go to India, one of the things I love to do when I go to India is to have street food. Yeah. I know street yeah. food, many people are scared of, you yeah. know, because... That's the best kind. I know, that's, that's the, best the best kind. Yeah, you got to take your chance. Right? You got to cut off play your luck sometimes. Seriously, Bill Gates was in New York recently, about a week back, and his trip was covered on social media. He was eating a hot dog from the street food vendor. Yeah. And he said in so many words, I'm paraphrasing, if you haven't eaten hot dog on the street for, for, of New York, you haven't been to New York. No. And I totally agree with yeah. him. When I visit New York, one of my meals has to be a hot dog. So I will encourage you to find a good street food place in India 
and check it out. And there are millions of them, but you must be careful. Yeah. It has to be the right place, which is clean, hygienic, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So most people think of Indian food, right? Just Indian food. But is it like subgenres? Like does Indian food get broken down by different, you know, subcategories? Uh, yeah. You know, it's regional, it's geographic, right. you know. As you move from north to south, east to west, you have this amazing treasure trove of dishes which are so different from each other. The main courses are different, the, the snacks are different, the desserts are different, the way they are served is different. So I think there is a lot of variety and a lot of, and even within the north, for instance, you know, the state of Punjab, which is the farmers, known as the state of the farmers, has a very different cuisine than the state of Kashmir, which is, you know, on right on north and northern India. Kashmiri food is extremely different from Punjabi food. And Punjabi food is very different from the food that you get in some other northern states, Himachal Pradesh, which is another state. Himachali food is very different. So every state has its own culture, its own, you know, uh, uh, traditional clothes, their own ceremonies, their own food. So yeah, the short answer is extremely diverse. So how Americanized is the Indian food we have over here? Uh, some of it is Americanized. I don't think all of it is. Uh, we've tried Indian food in a lot of different places. And some of it is what we call authentic Indian food. <laughs> we, we are reminded of the taste in India. Some of it is probably a little Americanized in the sense that the spices are different, the look is different, the way it's served is different. But we haven't found the food to have changed in its basic texture and its basic character. It's still pretty, you know, resonant of what we, what we, we are used to when we go back home. And now more and more, you know, grocery stores have opened up and restaurants have started becoming more and more, quote unquote, Indianized in the way they prepare food. So we have never felt that we miss home food too much. Sometimes we do, but for the most part, we are quite happy with the, what we get served in the U.S. Do you and wife have a favorite Indian restaurant here in the Seattle area? Well, we have a, a favorite Indian restaurant. Uh, there are two now. One is in Renton. It's called Naan and Curry. And one recently we discovered is in Des Moines, Washington, which is called Kanishka. Kanishka was a, was a king, so it's called Kanishka. We've, it's just recently opened about a year back. And the way they prepare food, the way they serve food is very, very nice in terms of how we expect Indian food to be cooked and served. These are the two that come to my mind. But we've eaten at a lot of good places which are not coming to my mind right off the bat. Okay, um, moving on. So what is consumer psychology? Uh, consumer psychology is uh, a domain of science where we examine how do consumers process information, how do they make judgments, and how do they make choices when it comes to purchasing products and services. So that's what consumer psychology is traditionally known for. Some people who are extremely clinical in their definition will say psychology really taps into the mind more than the behavior. So we separate consumer psychology from consumer behavior. Psychology is about how they think, process, and make judgments. Behavior is how they make choices and how they respond to different marketing elements that exist in their environment. And how do marketers like kind of use psychology to influence consumer behavior? Well, one, uh, one example, just to illustrate this with an example, is when, when marketers use celebrities to endorse their products. For instance, for many, many years, Tiger Woods was used as a celebrity by many brands. Today, Roger Federer is used by many brands. So the psychology underlying this choice is that a celebrity triggers certain feelings and thoughts in the minds of the targeted consumer. And presumably, the advertiser and the marketer understands that those associations, those triggers are positive. And assuming they're right, those positive triggers translate to the brand. So when I think of Roger Federer, I see Rolex brand of watches. If I think well of Roger Federer, and I see that his attributes and traits resonate with my understanding of what a good wristwatch should be, it will translate to Rolex. And therefore, I'll think well of Rolex. So psychologists will try to understand these questions. How does a celebrity of what kind impacts consumers' brand perceptions? How? And what does it result in in terms of thoughts, processes, and behaviors? This is one example of how psychology is used. Another psychological ex example from consumer psychology might be when you see a high-priced product, 
Does that lead you to think it is high quality or are you open to its quality judgments? And a vast piece of, a fairly significant amount of research has found that consumers think high price is high quality, but there are some situations when they don't think so. So psychologists try to understand when do consumers associate price with quality? When do they not associate price with quality? And this learning enables marketeers to decide how to price their product to some extent. This goes into one of the elements which they use to understand pricing. So back to education real fast. So have you taught college in the United States and in India, correct? Yes, I have taught in India. I have taught in some places in Europe and Canada. And uh, I have taught in the United States for a very long time. But me experience here, you found like a, maybe a different focus from the students, like maybe a, like Indian students are more focused than United States students sure. or United States focus or like more engaged or the, the student, pretty much a student. Uh, let me qualify. My experience with teaching has been in two with two audiences. One is the MBA student, the graduate student, and one is the executives. I have not taught undergraduate students in any country except in the U.S., so my comparison is only specific to MBA students and executives. Having said that, masters, graduate students and executives tend to be slightly older with more work experience. And they have decided to undergo some educational initiatives and efforts because they're motivated to do so. There is intrinsic motivation. So from that perspective, I find that there's a pretty high benchmark. They're all motivated. Whichever country I've been to and taught in, they're all motivated. They're all engaged. They work hard. They're very curious, they want to learn. And uh, so no, there is no difference in terms of focus, motivation, intelligence for the most part, and even culture in terms of how they see the interaction between the professor and the student in the classroom. I have not found a major, a huge difference in different cultures. Okay, nice. Uh I read on LinkedIn back on September 20th, you went to some kind of MBA reunion. Can you talk about that? MBA? MBA you do to an MBA reunion on September 20th, 21st. MBA union. M MBA reunion. No, I'm, oh, MBA reunion. Yeah, MBA. Ah, ha, ha, okay, okay. So the Foster School had a reunion of all its MBA classes. So Foster School has five MBA programs, if I remember correct. I hope my dean will not send me an email that you got it wrong. We have the full-time MBA, which is which we call the daytime MBA, the evening MBA. Then we have the technology management MBA, what we call the global executive MBA. And uh, we have, uh, there's a fifth MBA program, which I'm forgetting right now. My apologies for that. Uh, so there have five MBA programs that we um, uh, have in our product line. So this MBA reunion was about inviting all the students from all the classes who have graduated from Foster to come enjoy some social opportunities, build networks, and... Uh, have a very nice, you know, there was a dinner and uh, uh, where the dean was present. And the next day, uh, there are three professors who shared some research with them. And this was a learning moment, you know, for these MBA, for these alums. So it was a wonderful opportunity for some of us to connect with alums, for alums to connect with the school and the faculty and rebuild these, unit, these bonds and, uh, you know, uh, develop relationships. A very nice reunion. I, I, I was one of the professors who gave a talk at the second day of the reunion. And I really enjoyed my interaction with the Alums. So you always hear about the reason you want to go to school, like University of Washington or Harvard or Yale or University of Texas, like a top notch, like top 1% of schools, like the alumni connection, right? Like how much advantage does a student get from being an alumni at one of these schools? The Alums, I think are, um, let me say it depends in part on how strong is the initiative that the graduating university or school has in terms of staying connected with the alums. That's very important. Now let's assume that the university does not have a very strong alum outreach. If it does not have a very strong alum outreach, I would imagine that the benefits to the alum accordingly are compromised because the university is not outreaching, is not you know taking initiative in terms of supporting their learning endeavors and so on. If there is a university or a school like the Foster School has a very, very strong alum outreach. And I think schools like Yale, Harvard, NYU, Indiana, Columbia, UCLA, Michigan, you know, all these are good schools, uh, UT Austin, uh, they probably have very strong outreach programs. And of course, every university and school has different kinds of outreach. Uh, in our school, we reach out to them by way of asking them for research input. Uh, there are 
alums who are on the advisory committee for the dean, they direct the school in terms of where it should go. And they have policy, you know, decision-making rights at times. And we have these learning moments, learning opportunities, reunion. So alums, I think, are benefiting from these outreach uh, opportunities that the Foster School gives them. Uh, also, uh, some alums are very sustained and committed donors to the school. Of course, the school is deeply grateful and uh, appreciative of their donation, of the donations that they make. At the same time, I think the alums get a lot of emotional satisfaction out of donating to the school and advancing its research mission and its educational mission. Uh, so I sometimes contribute to the universities and schools that I graduated from. My wife and I do our joint contribution. And it is a moment of great joy for us that we are able to support the education initiative. We are not getting anything clinical out of it by way of any material benefit. It's more a feel-good benefit that we get out of it. But I think that is an opportunity which we really respect and are grateful for that our schools are giving us. So the alums have a potential, you know, a lot of opportunities to enjoy the benefits from the outreach. Now, are you still more of a like teaching professor or are you more on the research academic side? I'm more a research professor okay. who has a specific teaching load. So I still do research. I still publish research. And that's my, that's the nature of the job that I have at the school. Okay. So what, what does that mean? That, like you have to do a certain amount of research per year or like you have to, you have to produce a certain amount of like peer reviewed articles. Like what does that mean to be? Yeah. To do that? So a research professor at my stage, so I'm a full professor, I'm a chaired full professor. So usually people at my stage have already carved out a research path for themselves if they are still active in research at this stage of my career. So I've been out of the PhD program now for about um, uh, 30 years and uh, I'm still active in research. I still have a pipeline of research projects because I love and enjoy research tremendously. Now, do you pick what you want to research or, yeah. the, or the school tells you? No, I pick the research topics okay. that I enjoy working on. Now, the school has incentives for publishing research in specific journals. So those journals are considered to be the top journals. That's what gives school equity, research equity. It gives school research visibility. However, at my stage of my career, because I am where I am, I'm not beholden by those journals in a clinical way. Having said that, if I don't publish in those journals, those incentives don't come to me, okay? So the school will give me sometimes financial incentives, sometimes recognition, you know, all kinds of good things come to people who publish in those journals on a consistent basis. And I'm still publishing in those top journals, but I also publish in journals which are not on the school's list of top journals because I enjoy publishing there. Sometimes it's very hard to publish in these top journals. You go through the review process and you've spent a couple of years working on a research project and the journal says it's not a good fit for us. So you don't want to waste that effort. You find as good an outlet as possible for your work. So I do, I follow those kinds of, you know, more personally motivated efforts and initiatives. I also published a book recently with my wife the book doesn't the book doesn't quote unquote count as part of scholarship as far as the university is concerned though it is recognized as being active in the intellectual space the school recognizes that and the school appreciates whatever you know coverage and visibility we get and the school gets as a consequence of publishing that book unless somebody say so someone goes out the pub's article when the top journal is right and they say 4 years from now whatever they said was is proven proven wrong. Does that make that original author look bad because he did the research or just, or you just say, Hey, things change over three or four years or. Yeah. So thank you for that question. It is always something that we academics are thinking about. You know, we are kind of sort of walking on eggshells, so to speak. Uh, so uh, if your research is challenged, there could be types of challenge that your research faces. One type of challenge is that your research was flawed fatally. Which means you. I'm, I'm guessing that has to be a pretty bad. That's thing. a bad. That's a bad you association. Want you don't want that. If you've used bad methodology, bad theories, in the worst case, you have actually uh, violated the classic academic standard, and you have not reported the truth. You've actually made up the data or the story. Then, in some cases, we know that their careers are over. In some cases, when there's there was a professor who was found to have done this repetitively, repetitively over 30, 40 papers of his. So yes, there is a mechanism where your paper is retracted and it is it becomes public knowledge for, for eternity. Your name will be on that website, papers retracted. 
And I have to imagine that academic circle is kind of small, right? It's not like there's like billions of people who are academics or have a pretty like small group of people. It is a small, it is a small enterprise. Uh, so in the in the marketing field, which I'm in, I would say, of course, there are thousands of professors all over the planet. Having said that, I think the there are probably, and I may be wrong here, 2,000 to 2,500 of us who are publishing research in the top journals, who are publishing books, who are teaching at good universities, and we connect with each other at some point or time or the other. We meet at conferences and so on. So it's a very small community. You think about it, just two and a half, three thousand of us on this planet who are, you know, driving knowledge and marketing, so to speak. And again, I stand corrected because I'm sure my colleagues will send me an email who are listening to this, and I'll be happy to receive their criticism and pushback. So yeah, it is a small community. And uh, sometimes your research is called out. So in another case is when your research is called out, not because it is fatally flawed, but because science progresses. Today we believe X. Somebody says, oh, oh, X is true only in some circumstances. Under other circumstances, Y is true. So that is not, a, you know, sort of a death knell for the research which published X. That's how science progresses. It progresses incrementally. It tells us that theory was good at that point in time. Today we have to relook at this theory and we have to recalibrate our understanding of the phenomenon. Those things we all understand go on, and it is not seen as an attack on your professionalism, on your character integrity, or on your abilities, or on your skills. So depending on why the research is called out, I think that matters. I would think like if someone published an article, and they got criticism, they got, and they got real defensive, to me that'd be a red flag, right? Aren't you a scientist? Like, you should be, be open to criticism and open, like, you know, peer review, right? Yeah. I think scientists should be open to criticism, and most of us, I think, are. Peer review is the process that we have grown up with, which is basically founded on the principle that good research will be published after it has gone through very severe tests of rigor through review process. So we all understand that. Having said that, uh, I think science is a beautiful, beautiful human idea. Uh, so yes, we should be open to criticism, but we also have the privilege and the right to rebut criticism. That's how science progresses. Uh, that's sometimes defensive. Sometimes that is how intellectual domains progress. So if I publish a paper and let's say you criticize it and you have good reason to criticize it, I have the opportunity to say, yes, you're right under these circumstances, but I don't believe you're right under these circumstances. Or I think you read the paper completely wrong. This is what I'm trying to say, but you misinterpreted it. So I think science gives all of us those degrees of freedom to criticize and then to rebut and to, uh, you know, uh, respond. Yeah, I have to think if someone criticizes your work, they have to come with some kind of effect. They, they can't just say, hey, Shelly, this is wrong because I don't like you, right? They have to like have some kind of reference on facts, something to back it up, right? I'm sure 99% of us who challenge published research have intellectual reasons to do that and have evidence and ammunition to do that. Because if you challenge research without evidence, which is compelling, without good reason, intellectual good reason, then the way science progresses, the criticizer, the critic could become, unfortunately, the laughing stock. Yeah. Having said that, you know, even the published paper, which has been criticized, will face some negative, yeah. you know, associations because you know, uh, today narratives go out of our control very, very quickly. Some damage has been done. And then recovering from it takes a long time. But both all these opportunities I have seen play out in my in our field. And all of them are very relevant, you know, aspects of our of a profession. So these journals, do they pay you to put stuff in their journals? Or this this part of your like your job you have to do as a professor to yes. put in there? Some of them ask for payment, some of them don't. And so that's the short answer to your question. Whether the payment is a signal of quality, whether the journal that asks you for payment is incentivized to make money and therefore they will publish anything and therefore the quality is suspect, that is a theory some of us have espoused. I don't know what the truth is, to be perfectly honest. Uh, so I will hold my judgment on that. So let's go for like January 1st, 2025. You have like the go each year to be published in a certain number of journals or do a certain number of academic peer reviews or how does that work? So in my school, which is the Foster School of Business, this is what our algorithm is. Uh, we get financial incentives for publishing one paper every three years in a specific list of journals. 
So in marketing, there are eight journals. If we publish one of one paper every three years in one of these eight journals, then we get the financial incentive that is promised on paper. That is really the formula that Foster School uses. Other schools might have different mechanisms and algorithms and models. So it doesn't have to be in one year. It can be once every three years, as in my case, in our case. Some people publish at a crazy speed. Some people publish two papers every year. Some of us publish one paper every three years. Some of us have bad fortune, and we can't publish a paper once in five years but then in the fifth year, we get two papers, you know, that's how the research process works. It's not a uniform distribution, you know, it, it can be jerky. Uh, it sometimes comes in bunches. We have been working on five, six papers. They keep getting rejected, rejected, and then suddenly they go all get accepted. And all of a sudden you have four papers in the same year, or sometimes even five papers in good journals. This can happen. And the school recognizes that. So the school has some mechanism that they will see your pipeline. How many papers under review? How many papers in what stages of the review process? So sometimes we get benefit of doubt that, you know, we understand the research process is choppy, the publication process. So we will give you benefit of doubt. So that's how the internal, your own motivation and the school's incentives work, at least in my case. So, right, when you, when you write your next research paper, do you do it all yourself? Does people in the foster marketing program help you do collaborative stuff? How's that work? Yeah, so the research is mostly independent of the administration in the sense that the research problem that we investigate, and you know, some papers have multiple authors. So there could be three, four authors on a paper. We all, at least in theory, are chiming in, in terms of making contributions, intellectual contributions. Many times we do division of labor. One of us writes the paper, one of us collects the data, one of us analyzes it, one of us manages the review process, and that's fine. Division of labor happens. Uh, the schools, role is to be the, the entity where we have the freedom to do research. I think that's a huge deal, right? The school gives us incentives to do research. The school recognizes our research. The school employs us, you know, it gives us a foundation to be able to do these kinds of things. But in terms of direct input in the actual research, the process, the conceptualization and the data collection, the school gives us incentives. My school gives me some money to collect data depending on what kind of data I need. So that is the support that school gives, which I think is fabulous. It's, it's safe to assume you're, you're, I think it's called a tenured professor. Yes, yes. So what does that mean? I think a lot of people have the negative kind of taste, like if you're a tenured professor, you do whatever the hell you want, you can never get fired, right? I'm sure that's not true, but it's like, not, what, what does that mean? So a tenured professor, just to give you a slightly layered perspective, it is true that tenure, tenure in theory means that you cannot get fired unless two events occur, one of two events occur. Either you are found to have committed a felony, that's critical. If you, if you are a felon, you are kicked out and your tenure is revoked. The second is if the school decides to close down an entire department or an, the university decides to close an entire school. This has happened in some universities where an entire department was shut down because the school said it's not serving our mission. These are extremely rare phenomena, extremely rare as you can imagine, right? So uh, that's part one of the answer. The second part is, it's not, you can do whatever the hell you want. In our, in our terminology, verbiage, we oftentimes, sometimes we say this professor is tenured and based on their track record of research and teaching over the last seven, eight years, they seem to have dialed out, okay? Dialed out means they're not producing research, their teaching is kind of sort of just remaining above the bar, so to speak. They don't seem to be very motivated. And there are cases like that as well. But the universities that I've worked in, Jason, those cases are few and far between. There have been one or two or three cases, I can tell you, but very, very few people have dialed out. By the, the, the culture and the DNA of the schools that I'm at is are such that they are very highly research oriented. I'm sure they're competitive. They're they very competitive. They yeah, they're yeah. competitive. And for some reason, the mechanism is that the people who join these schools are intrinsically motivated to keep pushing the boundaries, to keep publishing research, keep doing well in the classroom, co contributing to the university by way of doing committee work, administration. So all of us are kind of sort of, we come with a similar DNA. Yeah. And on occasion, when the DNA is in conflict, with this expectation, uh, once in a while, you know, the professor 
goes through the process, goes through the motions, and we call uh, you retire as a terminal associate. You got tenure, yeah. and then you pretty much decided, this is all I want to do, and I'm not making judgment about anybody's life choices, right? The university is giving you that opportunity and that privilege. You've taken that privilege, you made the tenure cut, and now you've decided I've got other things in life that I want to do. And I think as human beings, we should have that freedom to make a decision for ourselves. People like me are still very engaged in research, very engaged in service and teaching, are probably too engaged. You know, I keep running around all the time and doing things that I enjoy doing. But uh, yeah, so that's the long answer to your question. But it's not that they can do whatever the hell they want yeah. to do. Because to be perfectly honest, in a very intense research university like mine, you can become a, you know, a terminal tenured associate, but I don't know, and I'm, I may be wrong, I don't think it brings you a lot of happiness. Because you see people around you doing all kinds of things, right? You're publishing research, you're doing great teaching, you're being asked to do this, that, 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 and you are not being asked to do those things. So you feel yeah. a little excluded and nobody's doing it because you're, a, you know, you should be excluded. You're, you're being excluded because you have not, you know, raised the bar, so to speak. So I think that is the mechanism which keeps us all, all the time engaged and excited about what we are doing. So I'll probably answer this wrong, the question, next question the wrong way. But when you were teaching, were you able to, how quickly were you able to say, okay, this student is like kind of brilliant. This student, I mean, this student is a kind of brilliant. This student, like, man, I got to help this person out more. Like how quickly were you able to like decipher your different students, like skills, talents, as far as like. You know, that's a great question. I'm so sorry. I do not have the magic lens to tell you that I can figure out where which student is going to become a world changer and which student is going to just dial out in life. I can't predict that at all. I go into a class always, always saying, every student here is going to change the world. What can I do? How can I serve a bridge as a bridge to help them from getting from point A to point B? I have to go with that perspective. If I don't, I believe I'm shortchanging, not just the students, but the school, myself, the university and the planet. I never assume a student is not good enough. Never. So from your point of view, tell us some pros and cons about being a, prof a professor. Uh, the pros, a uh, lot of freedom, a lot of, you know, um, nobody, very few people are breathing down your back. If you keep your nose clean, <laughs> if you get in trouble, then, you know, all bets are off. But otherwise, if you need to keep your nose clean, you are, this is probably the best kept secret job probably on the planet, at least the way I've experienced it in, in top class research universities in the United States of America. It's an amazing job. I feel so grateful and fortunate that I got into this career, frankly. I'm almost certain, and I can't predict because you know hindsight is you know what it is, but I probably would have made several times more money if I was in industry, if I was a consultant or I was a senior administration in a, a corporation or whatever, you know, I would have made truckloads of more money. There is no doubt about it. But today, when I see how I spend my time and the joys I get out of teaching, out of research, out of giving a talk, out of being on your podcast, out of talking about, you know, our book or whatever it is, it gives me real intrinsic joy and satisfaction that I have done this. I have advanced humanity in some way. I've helped people understand some phenomena in a better way. And the uh, the thrill, the joy, the excitement, the satisfaction of hearing your students do well is like no other I have experienced, no other at all. So those are the pros that I have enjoyed. And I feel every day I feel grateful, Jason, that I'm in this profession. My wife is a professor too. And we both of us have a very similar kind of a lifestyle. You know, we get up in the morning, we decide what we are going to do today. We enjoy our lives together. Almost every night we watch some kind of a movie or a series together without fail, unless we are traveling. We are able to spend time with a child. They're 22 years old. They're in New York. But we talk to them. We have all the time that we want. And we do all the professional things that we want. I don't know how many jobs will give me that opportunity. What are the downsides? You know, uh, I don't really know. And I'm not being biased about it. Some people who are, you know, who want to make, let's say, $200 million, $300 million net worth by the time they retire. This is not the job for you. You might luck out if you invest very carefully, you have stock options, you get into consulting in a big way or whatever, some company hires you and stuff like that. Yeah, you might, might get into the 10, 20, 30 million dollar net worth bracket. You have a hugely successful textbook, which is used all over the world. Yes, your fame skyrockets and 
and all the you know good things happen as a consequence of that those are the potential you know if you will call downsides but the financial incentives that we have for my family we have never felt oh i wish i could get another million dollars more or another 2 million dollars more for some reason our lives are really nice really happy low stress and whatever stress we create is our own creation <laughs> is our own creation to be perfectly honest you know we visit our family in india pretty much when we want there are times when we have to stay in seattle because we are teaching and so on there are expectations and of course you do that right but outside we live here in seattle you know one of the most beautiful cities on the planet really it's such a gorgeous city with great weather people complain about the rain and i can understand people have some serious you know health issues because of rain and you know one of my doctor student had a seasonal affective disorder so he couldn't stay in seattle i totally get it but coming from india where monsoon is a big thing this rain this is very nothing right literally it's a breeze you know we love the cloudy days we love the sunny days so i see overwhelmingly the positives very few negatives having said that the one challenge which i think is in any profession is that if your work is criticized and challenged and it is challenged to the point where you're seen as a fake academic i think the world writes you off very very quickly okay. so the exposure is great if you publish a lot of research you become very well known for your work and the exposure and so on you're covered by the media and you know all that good stuff you're seen as an intellectual <laughs> and that brings respect with it that really does you know when i tape tell people that i'm a professor at uw i can immediately see the way they look at you it changes you know so you get a lot of respect but then it comes down pretty rapidly if you have not played by the rules of the game i think that happens even in industry however there is a cushion in industry where your financial net worth is so high that even if you are found to have engaged in malpractices you have a cushion to fall back on probably so there are those financial ups and downs that we have to work with but i find this to be an incredible job but it's not for everybody it's not for everybody you have to dig deep you have to be willing to work by yourself you would need to learn to be a lone ranger a cowboy cowgirl whatever you want to call it you have to learn to be that and you have to every job you need to learn many many things and uh, if you don't like to write and if you don't like to think by thinking i mean think real 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 deep really go into a small little phenomenon which the world will say why are you looking at this phenomena for heaven's sake don't you have a bigger you know fish to fry sometimes we look at very very small problems by the by by standards of some people and we go deep into it you like that and you like writing you like being by yourself you like being challenged you like being criticized this is the profession for you so tell me one question Do you happen to know a lady named Dr. Evelyn Smith? She just got a PhD in marketing for UW a couple months ago. Evelyn Smith? Evelyn Smith. Evelyn Smith. Yeah, Evie Smith. Evie, of course I yeah. know Evie. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, Evie cool. was my teaching assistant. Oh, what? Oh, wow. Yeah. She was on a podcast like three months ago. Okay. Yeah, good night. Yeah, I think she's at UK now teaching. She's yeah. at University of Kentucky. Yeah. Very happy for her. Yeah, she's so freaking smart. Yeah, she's yeah. great. She's incredibly smart. She's very enterprising. Her research is really fun. She's just got out of the PhD program. Yeah. she started a career we love our alums from our phd programs yeah. and we want them to succeed so a big high five to evie wherever she is if she's listening to this so one thing i asked evie was like how hard was the phd program she said jason is the hardest thing i ever knew <laughs> went times 10 right so having said that how do you prep like new phd students like with all the you know stuff they have to go through right cuz i'm sure i'm sure it's not easy i mean it can be easier right it's not it shouldn't be easier i would think right no it's not how do you like prep them for like hey this is going to you know like a better term is going to suck for you and you have to make sacrifices yeah personal life professional life social life and you know all that kind of stuff absolutely uh, thank you for asking nobody has asked me that question ever before so i'm so glad i'm getting an opportunity to share some of my experiences so here is the structure of the phd program that i went through and i understand business schools phd's are similarly structured in most parts of the world you go through what we call coursework for one most likely two years where you take courses in the foundational fields like statistics economics psychology and whatever is your interest and so economics and we learn theories we learn methods how to do research how to collect data what are the dominant theories about different phenomena that are currently existing what is the philosophy of science so that takes about 2 years during these 2 years you are encouraged to think of some research domains that you are interested in so keep your ears and eyes open attend talks by good people who have published research read research papers 
and try to figure out what is a problem that you are excited about. What you see in literature, the literature has published, let's say on a topic, for instance, are influencers useful or not useful for brands, right? Should we use influencers or not? If that topic excites you, read up all the literature on influencers and persuasion and see if there is enough contribution to make which nobody else has made. Then the last two, three, sometimes four years, you take to do research, actual research you do. And part of it is your dissertation work. Part of it could be another project or two that you're working on, on your own or with some co-authors, could be with some faculty. And I think those are the three, four years when the rubber starts hitting the road and you start developing, you know, neurons start firing in a different way. You start understanding what the research method is, what the research process is, and that, I think, is a really, really grueling task because you realize that your ideas may or may not be exciting. You realize that your ideas are not as test worthy or even, you know, the, your hypotheses are not going to hold. So it can be a pretty sobering time for many people. It can be a very humbling time for many people to realize that what they are thinking is not going to be fleshed out with the evidence or what they are thinking somebody else published it just one year into you being inquisitive about it, you know? So, and then you attend conferences and you see thousands of papers being presented. So that I think is the, using your phrase, the real learning. That's when you are learning to put your coursework into practice and checking yourself out, holding yourself to higher and higher standards of research, integrity, data collection, methodology expertise, theoretical expertise, that's when it starts happening. And once you have done your PhD like EV has, then your job becomes, you start publishing papers, you start teaching, and you start contributing to the mission of the university or the school that you're in. And that becomes an even more grueling task because now your papers are going to face the, the real test, you know, the litmus test of being criticized by reviewers. And the reviewers, for the most part, are really smart people who will criticize anything that's bad in the paper. And that's the process you have to follow. So it is grueling. It is grueling. And it is certainly not for the weak hearted. Recently, I read in on some website that a PhD actually has mental health consequences. And uh, I thought about it. Uh, I think there may be some traction to it. I hope for more evidence to appear, which will show that this initial study has you know, it's it's consequential. It means what it's, it is right. Uh, so I can imagine you're lonely, you're doing your own thing, you're being criticized, you're being, you know, constantly in a manner of speaking, your work is being attacked. So you need to develop that muscle. And if you don't have the capability to, I think everybody has the capability to develop that muscle, but some of us more, some of us less. But if you, you know, become a little phased by criticism and it starts affecting your self-esteem, it starts affecting your self-belief in some cases. My first two years in the academ academic world after I graduated were hard because all my papers were rejected in the first two, three years. And I started doubting my intellectual capabilities. You know, I said, I'm not good enough. Serious self-belief and self-esteem issues. Then one of my really close uh, friends and believers in me, who was my faith dealer, leader, uh, he said to me, or she said to me, or they said to me that, uh, you dig in. Don't give up, fight, dig in. And I use that guidance and encouragement and then a whole new treasure trove opened for me. When I started publishing papers in good journals, I started believing in myself again. So yeah, there are some challenges that the PhD brings with you and people should be aware of those challenges before they get in. Is there a circumstance or situation where you should tell someone, okay, maybe this is enough for you, right? Yeah, so there are some, you know, there are some uh, checkpoints during a PhD program. Uh, at the end of first year, second year, and third year, we have PhD assessment time. So each year they are subject to a certain evaluation. And that is the point when we tell them you can progress forward or we think this is not the right thing for you. Do we make a mistake? We could, you know, because no testing mechanism is perfect. But yes, we do tell them at times that this is probably not the best program for you or the best pursuit for you. Of course, if they decide that the school decided to let me go, they may still have self-belief. They may still apply to another university and they may still guide, they may get in and they may still graduate. You know, you never know. That can happen. So yeah, that's the answer to your question. Do that I have. students, they get a salary or anything? Or yes, they do. 
for the most research schools they do most research schools there are some phd's for instance that's like a decent salary or like livable or like yeah i'm sure not minimum wage but like you it's, know. yeah it's not, i don't know minimum wage i i really have to do the math i never did it before thank you for asking i will do it later but they get subsists definitely decent salaries for instance some universities will pay them 25 to 30000 dollars a year plus no tuition for the coursework okay okay so that is the money they get for their day to day expenses but they have to do some work for it which is called research assistantship yeah. or teaching assistantship some universities pay as much as 40 50000 depending on the research endowment and the university's policies the that's probably the range 25 to 50000 dollars and they, they i'm guessing they get free housing too on no campus. no no free housing they don't get free housing okay. i may be wrong let me take that back uh, i was at nyu i had to pay for my own housing I know at Foss I'm guessing that's expensive for Manhattan. For Manhattan it's expensive at that time I did my PhD in 1990 to 95 and uh, the typical one room rent in a good neighborhood was about $500. Okay. And my monthly stipend after taxes was $1100. <laughs> so it was tough. It was really tough. I had to eat breakfast cereal for breakfast <laughs> and pizza for lunch and dinner for the most part. So I had to survive, right? The sacrifice they don't talk about, right? That we don't talk about. I agree with you. I used to walk 20 blocks because subway was expensive <laughs> from my room to my campus. Uh so yeah, so uh, the it's not uh, that bad. I think you learn to you learn the whole business really well and uh, uh some people cynically call it cheap labor because if the student is doing research assistantship or teaching assistantship for which they are being paid, the professor with whom they are attached gets the work out of them but i don't think it's cheap labor i think they are learning a lot they are learning with the professor they are learning how the system works they are learning how to publish a paper and if you are a clever and a smart phd student you will not look at the downside you will say i'm here what can i learn in these 4 5 years especially with professors actually like teaching you stuff helping you network and that's exactly that's right my co-advisors i feel blessed i had those co-advisors they pushed me they made me do work it was not a pleasant experience many times but if they are listening thank you for being my co-advisors i'm still in touch with one of them we still publish papers together after 30 years we are like brothers you know he's my elder brother he still uh, very strictly tells me what things to do you know after being in the field for 30 years so i really really respect and appreciate that relationship so when you publish a paper does a teaching assistant get any like notice like any like recognition of that So yeah you get recognition by way of uh, you know the world learns about the paper now journals will do public relations this paper was published in our journal as an academic we read those journals so we know that paper has been published and if you are fortunate that paper gets recognized in some award function which is i have never got a, a major research award for a research paper but some of my colleagues my friends have and i always wonder how did they get this award it's so cool to get these award this award i really respect them for that you know so that's the nature of the recognition sometimes they get once in a while your paper may not get recognized immediately but it becomes a major theory in later in life yeah. michael porter's theory of comparative strategy michael porter at harvard took 6 years to finish his phd is what i understand and his comparative strategy theory is today taught at almost every harvard decent business school you know this happened like 40 years back 40 50 years back so at that point in time you know it wasn't kind of an award winning dissertation as far as i know but he's becoming he's becoming he's become synonymous with competitive strategy in my understanding and if michael is listening my apologies if i'm misrepresenting your work but uh, so your rec the recognition might come years later you know so mozart was not recognized during his lifetime he was recognized in the court of his kingdom but he was not recognized globally he was recognized centuries later sometimes that's how research works so there's like it's called the nobel prize for physics right we're big prize is there something equivalent to that for the marketing no no there is a nobel prize for economics that is the closest business related field okay. but there is no nobel prize for economics there's no nobel prize for psychology okay no so what is a transgression okay this is coming to the uh, something that i have published recently thank you for asking so we talk about brand transgressions jason let me give you an example then i'll define it formally so the the boeing company is going through some really turbulent weather right i'm sorry 
to use that pun. We, I don't mean to laugh, but yeah, they're going some stuff right now. And we love that cooperation, you know, not just because they are in our backyard and we are in their backyard, but because it runs the economy, the world economy, the company, the, you know, transportation, military, so many things are rested on the company's uh, activities. So when Boeing's first 737 MAX crashed in 2018, you know, I don't know about my, uh, many people thought it was probably an aberration, you know, once in a while flats, flights crash. Then another crash occurred in October 2019. Same plane, same model, 737 MAX. That is when the scrutiny started. And over the last five years, what we understand is that it has become pretty clear that the contribution to those crashes probably lay in Boeing's internal production and their overall corporate strategy. That's what we understand. So a transgression, this is an example, just to give you a sliver. A transgression is defined as a brand violating an implicit or explicit expectation from one or more of its stakeholders. So in the case of Boeing, the expectation was that their planes don't crash. When they do, maybe one off, but when two crash, then what is the company doing about it? So one thing is a transgression. Another transgression happened again in 2019 when Starbucks, one of their Philadelphia outlets, there were two black customers who were young customers in their 20s. They were sitting and a barista asked them multiple times, what would you like to have? And they said, we are waiting for an associate. And the barista, after some time, called the cops on them. I remember that. You remember that. Remember that yeah. And they were in prison Definitely for a few a hours. Look. Definitely yeah, a bad look. Yeah. They were in prison for a few hours. And uh, that is a major transgression because you are, uh, you know, all kinds of possibilities emerge in terms of why the barista did what the barista did. Uh, then there is the famous case of Volkswagen emissions cheating scandal. Yeah, I was asking about that right, later right. on, yeah. That, is, that was in Germany, but it, it, it had global implications, right? And uh, uh, then there was uh, the quote-unquote transgression in China when Dolce & Gabbana, the famous Italian brand, they released some ads which were perceived by the Chinese people and those who saw them the world over as sexist, misogynistic. You know, so uh, th that's what a transgression tends to be, where a company engages or either knowingly or unknowingly in some activity which creates a perception that it has violated some norms of behavior. And that's one. The second thing is the transgression should have caused some pain or hurt. If it didn't cause a pain or hurt, many people won't even bother about it because it didn't matter to them, right? But if it causes pain or hurt, then it becomes a serious issue that the company has to address. So the second part of the, that's the answer to your question. What is a transgression? <clears throat> so transgression is a transgression from the point of view of the company, the employee, the public in general. Stakeholder, other stakeholders, the regulations, regulators, government, uh, the, the shareholders, you know, anybody could be impacted by the transgression. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the VW one, right? Because I remember that okay. recently. Okay. I, I actually did research for the, for the interview. Mm -hmm. And I, I thought about VW and it happened to be in your book too, right? Yeah. I remember like, we were like, VW did what? Because like, you think that like, that'd be the last company to do it, right? You're, you're a German-based company, you know, by safe engineering, like, why would you do that for? Yeah. And they, and they, and they tried to hide it for a little bit too, didn't they? They not, yeah, they, they hid it for quite a long time until they couldn't hide it anymore. Yeah. So this is what we understand, how the case unraveled. Uh, internally, we understand that Volkswagen was under pressure, either of its own making or because of competitive reasons to increase their sales in the United States of America. And U.S. has very strict emission standards for automobiles. And, so, so off uh, subject, mm -hmm. I was stationed in Germany like a total of four and a half years in the Army. And they, they're like all eco-friendly, climate. So to me, I, mean, I don't know, to me it's surprising that, that the German standards for emissions are not higher than the United States, right? Yeah. To I, me, that doesn't make any sense. I don't know the... German standards, to be honest, relative to U.S. standards. <clears throat> so what, what Volkswagen, in their wisdom or lack of it, what they did was they installed what later came to be known as emissions cheating devices, which reported emissions lower than they actually were. And this was their perceived you know, way to get through the regulation in the U.S., hoping that this will lead to greater sales for their brands. <clears throat> over, over the years, it was found out that about 500,000 cars 
were had these had had, had these emissions cheating devices installed, <clears throat> and more damaging, as much as they denied, their CEO denied that I didn't know about it. I didn't know about it. Then later on, it was found that he knew about it, and he had explicitly sanctioned the use of this device. Today, what we understand is he is missing and he's wanted for criminal misconduct in several European countries, <clears throat> is what we understand. So um, that was the case that Volkswagen had to deal with. Uh, they, they faced lawsuits all over Europe. In US, they really, really had to face some serious consequences. On date, if I'm not mistaken, they are poorer by about $35 billion <clears throat> because of that emissions cheating device that they installed. Of course, they had to withdraw it, they had to recall their cars, and so on and so forth. So that is the case that Volkswagen had to deal with. And one was the transgression of volitionally installing those emissions cheating device, knowingly, advertently. The response to that transgression, I think, created what could have been a noose around the neck of the company, which was they lied about it, according to our understanding, according to our case analysis. They misrepresented the truth for many, many years. Yeah. Do you think they've overcome this? Yeah, they're still struggling with this. They're still dragging. Well, I don't think they are out of the woods yet in terms of the case. The cases, are, they're still involved in legal cases. Uh, they do not have these emissions cheating devices any longer. All those cars have been recalled, which is good news. And they have recovered a lot of ground in terms of sales. Having said that, I think their brand is still tarnished. It'll take several years before the brand association of being a company which installed emission cheating devices will go away. It'll take some time. There's a question for you, and this probably wouldn't be ethical to do, but like that did happen like in 2013, 2015, right? 2019. 2019. 2019, yeah. Oh, okay. I thought it was like 2015. So... I, I correct myself. If I'm wrong, I, I stand corrected. Okay. Well, it was pretty recent. Right? Yeah, maybe 2015. So, like, 16. how come, like, I'm not saying this the right thing to do, but I'm thinking if I'm the CEO of BMW, uh, hey, you know, do an ad, compare me to, you know, Volkswagen. We don't okay. cheat. You know, we don't do these things, right? I, I mean, that's probably not done in the industry, right? You know what I, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, uh, great point. Great point. We see that in politics, right? We see yeah. today in politics, one candidate says, this candidate has a criminal record, you know? Yeah. So it's done in politics. Uh, in industry, specific to legal problems that a competitor faces, again, I'm not the most informed individual on the planet, but I have never seen a competitor attacking you yeah. in public, yeah. in the media. Yeah. They could use that as an opportunity to push their own agenda in the marketplace. When they realize that a competitor is struggling with sales or whatever, then they start pushing their own brand, they start aggressively advertising, they start promoting their brand, yeah. and so on and so forth. Yeah, those things we know happen, but attacking competitors in public is not seen as, I don't know about, yeah, maybe it's not seen as ethical. Yeah, or the, professional or something. or That's possible. That. The other thing is, you know, when you call, when it's what we say, the pot calling the kettle black, yeah. it's possible tomorrow the competitors yeah. Actions are revealed like, of some kind, you know? Yeah. So I think most companies and brands are sensitive to that possibility. At one point in time, Lufthansa airline used to say we are one of very, very safe airline. And the fact was they had never had a blemish in their safety record, so they could say that. They never said we are the safest airline in the That's world. Big difference. Yeah. Big difference. Yeah. And if assume for a moment, and I thought about it when I was working in advertising, if Lufthansa had a mishap. Will the other airlines go to town saying, look, they said we are the safest airline in the world, but they are not. I don't think airlines will do that because what if it happens to them? You know, so that probably is the rational reason why they don't attack competitors, but they do attack competitors on other dimensions. If the, the product is not effective, yeah. the product creates side effects or the product doesn't last long enough, you know, or whatever it is, you know, then they do attack them. Yeah, I might be rumors wrong. I remember this other VW stuff came out. People were like, well, first, like, this ain't true. There's no way. It's like, mm. and then, oh, wow, it is true, right? Mm. I think it took the public a while because the VW had such a good brand back then, right? Bingo. Like, there's no way this is possible. Like, someone is lying or it's false reporting, and then, like, oh, shit, this is true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. I think you've touched upon this notion of brand equity. Yeah, brand yeah. Equity. You really talked about it's a strong brand. Volkswagen is a strong brand. So when people were in denial, like you were saying, I don't think it's true. How can Volkswagen be doing this? That comes partly from our understanding of Volkswagen as a brand and its country of origin, which is Germany. You know, we have certain associations 
And uh, an act of this kind is not usually one of those associations. Now, the fact that Volkswagen sales are back up, I think is also because how strong the brand is. You know, in some countries or in some, for some brands, this could have been pretty much the end of the road. But Volkswagen, it was not the end of the road and their sales are back up, partly because Volkswagen as a brand is a strong brand. They have built a very, very successful, powerful brand, much like, you know, BMW, Audi, Mercedes, whichever brands you can think of. <clears throat> so I was listening to a podcast your wife on recently, and you're all talking about what is doing, what, like doing the right thing. Mm. Like what is doing the right thing? Because I think people have different definitions of the right thing. That's right, that's right. So in what we say, the first principle that we talk about when a brand is perceived to have transgressed, we say the first principle, which is pretty much the parent principle, is do the right thing. And by doing the right thing, what we mean is the first reaction, hopefully, of the entire organization is how do we address the pain and the hurt of the stakeholders who have been affected by this perceived transgression. So the case that we cover is a well-known case, but it is forgotten, is that of Tylenol. Tylenol in 1982. Or that in Chicago, right? In Chicago, yeah. exactly. So that's the reason they have the uh, plastic things. Or the, or the bingo, powder. bingo, bingo, the tamper-proof packaging. Yeah. So Tylenol in 1982, seven consumers died from consuming Tylenol. And it was found that those Tylenol capsules were laced with cyanide 10,000 times what is needed to kill a human being. And even today, we haven't found the troublemaker. Nobody knows the troublemaker. But what Tylenol's CEO, his name is James Burke, and I hope the readers will engrave his name in their minds and hearts. The first thing he said, according to legend, in the meeting where they met to discuss how do we respond as a company was, how do we protect the people? That was the first question he asked. The second question was, how do we protect the brand? So we believe this is demonstrating the principle, do the right thing. He said, we need to protect the people. And the, the amazing thing about this case, Jason, is that this company wasn't found to be not at fault. Tylenol's cyanide lacing was not done in its production uh, facilities or in its supply chain. Somebody did it probably in the pharmacy. Yeah, probably opening some bottles up. And... That's exactly right. And Tylenol was not at fault. In spite of that, Tylenol said, how do we protect the people as their first question? Starting from that question, the entire playbook opened up. Everything started with that question. Tylenol became transparent like transparent. They invited the media, they invited the regulators, they voluntarily recalled the product, voluntarily they did a micro-level audit of their supply chain, their production. They opened a hotline for consumers. At that time, there was no internet, there was no email, there was no social media. There was 800 line. So they had operators who were giving consumers real-time information about Tylenol. And one of the most striking things that James Berg did was he went on multiple TV channels and radio channels and he said to consumers, don't buy Tylenol. He said, don't buy Tylenol. This was his way of doing the right thing. At today's prices, that entire three-month effort cost the company $300 million at today's effort, today's exchange rate, you know, today's purchasing power parity and stuff like that. Think about it. If a company has to do $300 million to basically fix their problem, most companies will balk at it. And there is so much stuff flying around in the media. Your reputation is at stake, right? Many companies will say, no, I'm not going to do this. And truth is, James Berg got a pushback from his own senior executives. They said it's an overreaction. But he was clear, how do we protect the people is doing the right thing. In our book, we say, first, recognize victims have you, your actions knowingly, unknowingly, or perceptually, even if in not real, has affected some victims in a serious way. They have been harmed. They are hurt. They need immediate response and closure. That's what is doing the right thing. Another case, which is a little different, but it has a different stakeholder and probably not as serious as uh, killing people, is Maggie Noodles, which is a brand of uh, instant noodles in India made by Nestle. And Maggie Noodles had this problem uh, which where some regulator, the government official, did testing of Maggi and claimed that it had more MSG, monosodium glutamate, than permitted. Now, the reason why this could be a problem is because most of Maggi, much of Maggi was eaten by children. And parents were very conscious about the health of their children. 
And more MSG means more health issues potentially. So the consumers were confused. They were angry. They wanted answers. But what Maggie did, in our opinion, was they lost a few tricks. Uh, they first of all kept silent for quite a long time. You can't afford to be silent in today's day and age for as much as even a week is too long. Even a week is too long. Sometimes we say even two days is too long. Number one. Number two, they went to the regulators and said, you're wrong. We are going to do our own testing. I think Maggie was speaking from a place of pride and Swedish you know, production standards. They are an amazing corporation, right? But we think this was not the correct thing to do. They pretty much you, took you the... You think some of it was like, we're from Sweden, you're from India. Obviously, you're from India. Your stuff is like sub, like sub could be. Could be. I don't know the reason, psychology behind it. But Maggie should have... I think we think Matt, Nestle should have known better because the regulators in India have been known to push back when somebody pushes them back. They have been known to do that. So Maggie got into the crosshairs of regulators. Now, un the, the, the good news is Maggie did its own testing and found it did not have excess MSG. So the narrative was false. However, by this time, the media the was all out over, was yeah. out there. All the public knows about it. There was boycott. People were saying boycott Maggie. The, ca the whole category of noodles, instant noodles shrank. The whole <laughs> category shrank. Maggie was 80% shareholder. So if the brand leader, dominant brand leader has these associations, people rightly or wrongly associate the whole category with it. The whole category shrank and there were boycott notices for Maggie. People were crying, you know, really loudly triggered, and crying meaning they were angry. And Maggie was, I think that they should have followed the Tylenol, Tylenol playbook. They're completely open. We know we are not at fault. Why do you have to worry? They should have opened their production units, supply chain, they should have done exactly what the what Tylenol did, and the truth would have come out. And they should have been completely open to every stakeholder on the planet. We are open. Tell us what you want to know. They released ads in which they said something to the effect, we understand there's a problem. We will be back. We know you're missing us. So it was almost, you know, some people read this as, you know, I don't know what. It was not appropriate. It was manipulative. Some people, some people felt it was manipulative. I love the brand. I grew up as a Maggie brand uh, consumer, you know? So I was very sad to see how the whole plot unraveled. It took them almost five years to get to what their current share is, which is 60, 65%. Even today, they're not an 80% shareholder because the narrative went out of their hand. They responded slowly and they did what we think they should not have, which has gotten the, got the crosshairs of regulators. So uh, the, the Tylenol case gives us a wonderful example of how do we protect the people? Maggie, I think, is an example of how not to respond when you have a transgression of this kind, even if it is not your fault. So we belabor this point in the book. You may be right, but the narrative is going out of your hand. You know, today social media takes on its own life. Oh, yeah. You know, people blog. There are podcasts. There are 8 to 10 million, I don't know, 8 or 80 million podcasts all over the planet. Some of us are hearing this story. And many people are hearing another story, you know, and people are making their own judgment. So I think the brand will, will be smart to say this is even if you're not at fault, we need to do something about it yeah. and do really, really fast. So the book lays out doing the right thing as the first principle. And then there are seven other principles which are rooted in doing the right thing. Once you are completely on board with this idea, take care of the victim's pain and hurt. You don't have to say we are wrong because you're not wrong. Probably, probably. But you do have to say, we are sorry you are hurting. We, are, we regret you're going through this. We will get to the bottom of it. Please stay tuned. But if you just stay silent, you are letting the, you literally- Someone let, else takes a narrative. Someone right. else takes a narrative and the problem has now gone way over your head. Uh, another case we talk about is Starbucks, the Philadelphia case that I talked about earlier. It was a classic case of how the company responded brilliantly to our knowledge. As soon as this incident happened, the next day, the CEO flew to Philadelphia, apologized six times in various forums, flew, met these two young customers, apologized to them, apologized to the whole Philadelphia community. Six apologies from a CEO, six apologies, you know. that There's some lesson in it, right? So uh, number one. Number two, they settled in private with these two consumers. They settled in private with the Philadelphia city, city of Philadelphia. Then they did what we think was the most uh, 
effective step that they undertook, which was they closed all Starbucks stores. I remember that. that. 8,000 of them the world, right? across the no, across US, US for a week. It cost that. the company about $17 million. I think that was a terrific show of walking the talk, you know, that we are saying respect, respect, dignity, dignity. We will do it ourselves. So I, they, it was a sliver of a demonstration of what kind of training is needed when these transgressions occur. And you can get caught off guard as a company when these transgressions occur. So you really need to train your people with, you know, what we are talking about. All these eight principles are critical, but nobody has a playbook. Companies don't have a playbook. They're pretty much, you know, fly off the handle whenever yeah. such things happen. And many of them respond really poorly. We were so surprised how Boeing responded. We were so surprised how Volkswagen responded. We were so surprised how Maggie responded, Nestle responded. In today's day and age, you know, you're not talking about in 1970, 1980. Yeah, like you said, all the stuff out there, you think they'd have like a game plan. That's know? right, that's right. But they don't. So from your point of view, what makes someone a great marketer? So I think a great marketer, to my knowledge, is uh, an individual who follows a structured process of understanding and enacting out the marketing strategy. And there are certain moving parts to a marketing strategy. Uh, a great marketer is one who first and foremost understands the context and the consumer really, really, really well. Really well. And uh, Steve Jobs, we all know Steve Jobs, he said that you should know the customer better than the customer knows themselves. You know, you should be able to anticipate the customer's needs before the customer can articulate those needs. It takes a lot of effort, experience, and passion to be able to do this. But uh, you are ultimately marketing whatever you're marketing to a segment of consumers in a context in which you're conducting the marketing strategy of yours. So that is the number one thing that a really good marketer knows. Uh, and knowing your customer is, you could clinically know your customer. You can say, this customer, I know so well and I know how to take their money. We understand you're operating for profit. We understand that, you know, most of the companies are. At the same time, I think a strong shot and dose of empathy is critical in today's marketing environment. You can make a lot of money and the consumers today are vocal, they're powerful, they can talk, they can spread all kinds of information. And if they feel that they have been played, yeah. they will talk and your reputation starts building up from there. So you need to be authentic about your effort. By authentic, we mean uh, that your promises, whatever promises you make, you must be able to fulfill those promises obsessively, moment to moment, minute after minute, hour after hour, day after day, year after year. And you are a company, you will make mistakes. If you make mistakes, which is what we call transgressions, be the first to own them and say, oops, we are sorry this happened, we will take care of it. That's what we call in the book brand authenticity. So a good marketeer, a really terrific marketeer, operates with these principles firmly inside their minds and hearts. And then there are some other steps, you know, they must understand their own companies, capabilities and resources, because you could, you know, facetiously, I talk in the marketing class, you know, I want to be Tom Cruise, you know, but I'm not, you know, I can't be Tom Cruise. And my guess is Tom Cruise kind can't be a marketing professor like I am. So I need to know my resources capabilities really well and know what are my boundaries, what are my limits. If I want to stretch those boundaries, great, then I have to do work at it, right? So I need to know myself as a company. What can I do? What can't I do? And if I can't do certain things and I want to attain that can't do, then I need to build resources capabilities. Then I need to understand my competition. I can't be sleeping, <laughs> right? If I'm sleeping and I'm doing a damn good job with taking care of consumers, but competition is doing an even better job, right? Sooner or later, I will become a dinosaur. So Harley Davidson faced this in the 50s and the 60s. They were the champions of the road in the US. When Honda came in, they were caught sn snapping. Uh, so they were really, really, you know, sort of uh, sleeping, in my opinion. They were taking, you know, long naps and they didn't do much about Honda taking over. And Honda came in with a very different strategy than more Japanese competitors came, came, came into the market. And in about 30 years time, uh, Harley Davidson's share went from 80% to 5%. So Harley Davidson was almost looking at its own grave. Then certain events took place where it was able to bounce back. And that's a different story. The point I'm trying to make is competition. Understanding <laughs> your competition is critical. What makes them tick? Can you imagine 
one day Weather Channel will be threatening ABC, CBS, and NBC. <laughs> Think about it, right? Weather Channel for crying out loud. ABC, CBS, NBC were the three big networks, but Weather Channel took such a large proportion of the viewership. Remember back in the day, it was the three channels. That's then, right. Then Fox came. That's right. And like. And Fox has kind of like <laughs> swept them away. Like That's a, right. Like, a Fox, thing. CNN, MSNBC, they yeah. all came. But it, the ABC, CBS, NBC never saw Weather Channel taking over or not, at least uh, hitting them hard. They never saw it. So you cannot minimize competition. You cannot take them lightly. And you really need to have a very strong competitive orientation. So this is what we call, you know, understand the context, consumer competition and your own company. And then look at ways and means of building resources capabilities, then identify your goals and objectives. What do I want to achieve? And then the heart of marketing strategy is, you know, uh, creating associations with a specific target segment, with a segmented, uh, choose a segment that you want your consumers to be. Choose that segment and then say, what do you want them to believe about you? This is what you want them to believe about you. And this is why you want them to believe it about, believe about you. Now go to town executing that. If you want to believe about us that we are a good quality, low price, or whatever it is alternative, execute it so that you deliver that belief. And how do you do that? You create the right alternative product and you price it and you know you promote it accordingly, you distribute it accordingly, and so on. And then you execute with your people. HR, you talk about HR. Leadership is so important, right? Leadership defines the organization's DNA. We are very, very convinced about it. And the people, how deeply they are uh Ma not married, but attached and committed to the brand being successful is uh, another big contributor to the marketing strategy. So back to, back to academic research, is it more important to find the answer to a problem or is it more important to find the right problem that you want to answer? Great question. I don't know the answer. I think sometimes you face with problems, you need to find the right solution. And sometimes you want to see what problem do I need to crack? So, you know, it's classic situation is there a gap in the market or is there a market in the gap? You know, a gap in the market is kind of like finding a solution to a problem. Ma finding a market in a gap is trying to identify the problem that you want to want to solve, right? So depending on the situation, both could be, you know, quite remunerative and profitable for companies. Uh, maybe anecdotal evidence suggests that many times when you find the right problem to solve, it opens up enormous doors. Right. So the first smartphone, for instance, or the first, you know, laptop or whatever you want to think about, you know, somebody thought about it and somebody found this problem to be solved. And as they started cracking the problem, the industry grew and grew and grew and grew and grew. And, grew, and our lives are not the same anymore. Those are finding a problem. Right. Uh, on the other hand, once the laptops are in now, some laptops have more problems than others. Now you're trying to find a solution to fix those laptops. And maybe there is some a, a very strong marketing opportunity there as well, you know? So when smartphones came in, there were only phones. There were only phones. They were called, I think, cellular phones or mobile phones. I don't know what the technology was called. They became smarter and smarter and smarter and smarter. Today, they can do a lot of what laptops can do, what computers can do, right? So laptops are facing competition from smartphones today. And if, if computer manufacturers and laptop manufacturers believe that they can crack this problem that are facing with smartphones as a competition, then they need to solve that problem. So that's the nature of the problem that we probably need to think about. So <clears throat> AI and marketing, is AI going to significantly change how marketing is done? Is AI going to be just like another tool for marketers? What's your mm. take on that? I think AI is definitely here to stay. Uh, we can deny it. We can push it back. We can resist it. Uh, uh, we we meaning the whole business profession uh, will benefit from embracing AI in a step-by-step -step manner. Uh, because embracing AI does not mean you become an AI-driven organization because doing so is not easy. You need people who are AI experts. You need resources. You need capabilities. You need to restructure your organization. The moving parts have all to be aligned with an AI-driven mindset. So it's not easy becoming an AI-driven organization. It costs a lot of money, a lot of talent. Talking about HR, some of the AI experts, young people are paid an enormous amount of money because that expertise is very severely limited today on the planet. So AI is going to change marketing, I think as follows to begin with, to begin with, uh, AI will probably help marketers uh, execute strategies which they have thought about. So when marketers want, for instance, the strategy is that we want to become 
a luxury brand in China. Let's assume that that's what your strategic direction is. Now, AI will help you understand how you go about executing it. AI will take all the information, will analyze all the information, will give you scenarios, will design pricing strategies for you, will design advertising for you, will do all that kind of work, but won't say do this. It will say here are the options that you can possibly consider. And then you as a strategic thinker will probably need to cherry pick which strategy is the best for you. AI will also help you understand your context and consumers better. So we are talking about uh, an idea which is fascinating, which is called the digital twin. It's not new, it's about a 60 year old idea, but today is getting into the business minds. You create a digital twin of your targeted consumer. And what that means is you have data of your consumer who's in your target segment, the typical consumer. They have been blogging, they have been searching online. All this data is being created you know, on the internet. You take that data and create a persona of that consumer on the digital landscape. And then you use that digital consumer to play around with levers. For instance, you say, okay, I want to increase the price. How will this consumer really react? I want to change the promotion. How will this consumer react? How long is the consumer going to stay with me? You build those predictive models based on that digital twin persona. I think AI will enable us to do all these things. Uh, I don't, I'm not in another functional field in management, but today AI can replicate a whole city. You can create a digital city. You can create a digital factory, right? So if you create a digital factory, a manufacturing unit, think about it. I change one manufacturing specification sitting on my computer and I can see what are the downstream consequences of changing that specification. I don't have to actually go to the factory and do it. So AI can enable us to do all this, what we call simulation. I think AI will change our lives that way. Uh, you might have heard of the strike that Hollywood screenplay writers had two, three years back, where they said screenplay, the, the, the threat was that AI will write screenplays. And so they were threatened, very, very seriously threatened. And I think we need to take, you know, we need to probably think about this. I think some of this will be real, unfortunately. Some of this will be real. And... Uh, my hope is just as humanity has evolved with all kinds of technology threats in the past, we will evolve even with this technology threat. We will become smarter, brighter, we will adapt our skills, we will become, you know, we will understand what is space for AI, what is our space, and we will develop our resources accordingly, is my expectation. But AI is here to change. AI will share health, it will change healthcare in a big way. I think we will have real-time access to medical experts, you know, who, who may be chatbots, but they have deep expertise. Uh, we will have all kinds of, you know, uh, healthcare companies will have an ability to test their drugs without hurting people or animals or whatever. So all these things will be happening. And it might take another five to 10 years, but I think that's what's uh, that's what we are looking at. Yeah, not the same thing. I know the reset this uh, dock worker strike on the East Coast, right? And one of the demands was, of course, more money. One of the demands was like, you know, no automation, right? And people are like, like, well, well, if you're striking, you do the wrong thing because we think they can do, we on strike, they can bring automation in and prove they can replace you. And then like within three days, they settle the strike, you know? So, yeah. but the thing is like, like, like I say, there's always like change, right? Even back in the 1890s when the cars took over the horses, right? The, I'm sure the people back there like, what are all the jobs going to be for people like, you know, shovel shit behind the horses, right? Or saddle horses, right? I mean, it's going to come, right? It, it's going to come. I think change is coming. And I was, my, 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 my guess is, and I have, I'm not necessarily a good predictor of the future. So, I would like the listeners to listen to this with a fistful of salt. My guess is in the, in the management field, in the business field, the strategic thinking part will stay with human beings. We will still need to think about what kind of strategy do we want our brand or company to follow. But the execution, much of the execution will go to AI. That's what I think will happen, I think. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see where it goes. I think another five, seven years, we will be... Uh, in a very different world is my expectation. Yeah, and I don't think most Americans realize what's coming, right? Uh, I hope, I hope, for the sake of our country, I hope you're wrong. I hope they realize it's coming because we need to be prepared. Yeah, and we need to develop skills. You know, we need to. You know, I know it's easier said than done, and I'm following my own guidance. You need to develop the skills and a new set of skills and resources 
to figure out how do you become more successful when AI happens. We need to figure that out. So I'm developing research, which is AI related to some extent, you know. I was talking to a gentleman yesterday who lives in Germany to understand how the brain works when you see certain marketing stimuli, and he uses an AI algorithm to, uh, to analyze the data. So we need to develop these uh, new methods, new technologies, new resources, new skills, and it will be challenging. It will be challenging. But as you said, we have always had change. Yeah, always. Always. Change. Every, always. Yeah. Third, it, it changes all the time. Yeah. So this next yeah. question, you might have to be careful how you answer it, right? So talk about the pros and cons of writing a book with your wife. <laughs> I think the cons are pretty clear too for everybody, right? <laughs> you're, in, in, you're in each other's face, you disagree, and you have sometimes these knockout, drag out battles, and and the relationship gets affected for a little while, and all that kind of stuff happens. But so let me give you the context in which this book came about. We were quarantined during COVID. This was when the first few cases were unearthed in Seattle. The first 10, 11 cases on the planet, on the US came from Seattle. So it was quite scary. There was a lot of anxiety. And, you know, as, as outdoorsy as we are, we had to stay at home. And we, I was writing a paper with some co-authors on how COVID will impact marketing. I'm very grateful for that paper because it taught me that during pandemics, when consumers are quarantined, their personal relationships are stressed. That was a huge moment of an aha for me. Is that one thing not to you? I think a lot of people during that COVID time, they found out, I love my spouse, but I'm learning I don't like them, right? Yeah. Some of, I think that's part of the reason why the relationships get affected. Divorce rates go up. People start drinking a lot, alcoholism and all that. So I used that learning. I spoke to my wife and our daughter. I said, look, this is what I'm learning. This is what pandemics do. So let's have a game plan. And we had a very honest conversation between the three of us, how to distance ourselves from each other when we can't stand each other. When do we come together? How do we resolve problems? How do we, you know, never raise a voice during this quarantine period, you know, listen to each other, stay in different parts of the house, which is fine, but be communicative. And so we had a game plan and grateful for my job that that game plan was in action. So that was one reason why we were able to write this book. The second reason was this, I was doing some research on brand transgressions with some co-authors. My wife's research is in business ethics and corporate social responsibility. And some of brand transgression related issues, they gel with corporate ethics, corporate and business ethics and corporate social responsibility and clearly with brand strategy. So I started thinking about it. I said, you know, we don't know how this pandemic is going to long, going to last. So we need to do some work. We need to create some value, you know? So I asked my wife, what do you think about a book of this kind? It was a very random idea. So good for her. She's always circumspect about big ideas because she realizes that execution can take a long time. So we kept talking about it. And then we had these dinner table conversations. And our daughter chimed in with their perspectives, wife and me. And we just started talking about it, talking about it. And one thing led to the other. And lo and behold, we started writing the first chapter. That's where it came from. Then we got help from somebody who did research for us. And then we wrote multiple drafts. We wrote probably 100, 150 drafts for this book over the course of two, two and a half years. Then we go, went to publishers. And very fortuitously and fortunately, the publisher we published with, they approached us. And we talked to them. We thought they were really good people to work with. And that's how the book came about. We had probably two or three really bad arguments, but not anymore. Not anymore. So I think that learning where we discussed how to minimize conflict while we are quarantined was the backbone of our experience. So back to regressions. Is there an example of a company you can, you can tell us about where they didn't overcome regression and, and, and it caused them to go out of business? Yeah. Yes, we, we, we talk about two cases. One is in Japan and one is in the US. Uh, let me talk about the Japan case first. It's more current, so to speak. It's a little more recent. There was a company called Snow Milk Products in Japan, considered to be a flagship brand for milk products in Japan. And 12,000 consumers fell sick from consumer their, consuming their products. And the company's senior executives completely dis denied that it was their fault. They distanced themselves from the problem that these consumers were facing they did nothing for these consumers. And later on, as the case unraveled, it was found that their production was at fault. 
the food poisoning took place during the production. And uh, the company kept stonewalling, kept pushing back, kept resisting, kept attributing the blame. They actually, I think they said, they, they basically said we had nothing to do with it. And later on, the media said they were lying. All the top executives were fired. The company closed down. They merged with another two companies. The company doesn't exist anymore. Uh, fortunately, I don't think anybody died in the process, fortunately. The other more egregious, in some ways more egregious case was with a company called Dalcon Shield, D-A-L-K-O-N, Dalcon Shield. And this was again in the 80s, the first intrauterine contraceptive device to prevent births was the Dalcon Shield. You know, today we call it basically an IUD, is the common verbiage. The first IUD was created by Dalcon Shield. Good for them, pioneers, right? Unfortunately, they had not done their due diligence. They hadn't done enough research. And they went too soon with the product. And the product was very successful. Almost 4 million shields were installed in the bodies of women. Uh, 2.7 in US alone. And then the trouble started when women started complaining of the pain that they were experiencing with the shield in their body. And some of them started developing horrible diseases. And the doctors were not trained to take out the shield comfortably. It had teeth on it. You can think about taking out the shield from a woman's private parts and how it probably hurt them. And the company said even a novice can take out the shield. So clearly there was misrepresentation. The company was under a lot of scrutiny. They started blaming the consumers for their sexual lifestyle. Oh. That kind of st stuff started happening. Whoa. It was pretty, pretty horrible. Uh, the company did not go public with the dangers of the shield for eight years. Eight years they took to go publicly with the dangers of the shield because during these eight years, they were basically stonewalling, distracting the publics, were trying to use legal cases, trying to settle cases privately and saying, we are not at fault, we are not at fault. Once they went public, then of course they went bankrupt. They went bankrupt. And uh, hopefully some of those people went to jail. Yeah, uh, not, none of them went to jail. None of them went to jail, unfortunately. In my, and we say that in the book, with the, in the last paragraph, that uh, none of them faced any jail time. So yes, companies close down if they do these kinds of things sometimes, not all the time. That's the human story. Uh, sometimes they go bankrupt. But some companies recover brilliantly if they do this really, really well. We talked about Tylenol. They recovered brilliantly from that episode. Starbucks recovered brilliantly from their, uh, you know, uh, problem with the Philadelphia store. And we think Boeing has got into trouble because of the way they've handled it. Yeah. They handled it very badly in our opinion. The first CEO who was in charge of this problem, Dennis Muhlenberg, is, was fired. Because the first crash took place, he said the airline was at fault. And he said the pilots were not well trained, they did not follow protocol. The second crash took place, he again followed the same script. But by that time, it was clear that there was something else going on. And it took them a half-hearted apology. And I think they just messed it up right from the first crash. And of course, the door fell off the plane. Yes. And to me, I mean, of course, a plane crash is way worse. For me, it's almost like a door coming off is almost as bad as worse, right? It could be worse. Alaska Airlines door yes, fell yes. off in January, yeah. right? And it was the same aircraft, 737 MAX. So the, the evidence is not sort of random evidence any longer. It seems to be systematic evidence. And now we know that the company had, you know, production problems, had uh, raw material sourcing issues. Its business model of profit at any cost fed into this situation. They were hyper competitive with Airbus. They were too, too quick to launch the product. So all these problems are coming out. And uh, they have had, now they have a third CEO in place in three years, four years, Kelly Ortberg. He's now the new CEO. He's now facing the strike of the yeah, workers. The machinist strike. The machinist strike. So I might be making this up, but I remember reading somewhere here somewhere where back in the day, Boeing was run by engineers, mm. but now they're run by like pencil pushers or accountants, right? Mm. The more concerned with the bottom line. I don't know if that's true or not. I might yeah. be making that up, but. I'm not sure either. My apologies. What I, we learned through writing that case in the book, we cover that in great detail. I'm not sure about engineers were running it versus accountants running it or or marketing people running it, I'm not sure. So uh, I just want to be careful in what I say. But what I do believe is that when Boeing and McDonnell Douglas merged, at that time, 
Boeing's model became significantly more predicated on profit maximization than it was before that merger. Before that merger, it was more about making the best, the finest, the safest planes on the planet. And the money, if you do that, the money's going to come. That's right. That, yeah, the money will come. You know, And they were a very successful organization. They were a brand leader, global leader. Yeah. People used to dream of flying a Boeing. And even today, you know, I mean, I love the corporation. It's an amazing corporation, 100 years old. Uh, I, so I think that was, the, that was the critical turning point when the merger took place. Do you remember what year that was? Uh, I, we have it written in the book, I forget. Okay. But some people said, and again, I'm quoting from the book, that is it that Boeing has taken over McDonnell Douglas? Has McDonnell Douglas taken over Boeing? Yeah, good point. Because the culture shifted towards McDonnell Douglas's culture rather than Boeing's culture. No, Boeing was the one did take over. That's exactly right. So I think, uh, so I don't know whether it was engineers or accountants, but it did become a lot more, significantly more, you know, uh, in one of the principles in our book, if I may use that to close this answer, we, one of the principles that we talk about is choose principle over profit. And profit will follow, is what we captured in that principle. You know, if you do profit over principle, you will compromise on principles. And that's when, you know, things will start falling apart. And Boeing's case is what we talk about. You know, they chose pro profit over principle. And did you do research the book, did you come over the case of Bluebell ice cream? No. So Bluebell ice cream, I, I'm from Texas, it's a Texas ice cream company, I'm like, Everyone in Texas, Bluebell is the best ice cream ever, right? Like, mm. talking mm. about brand equity, the best of best. Mm. It's like Bluebell ice cream, <laughs> Blue Star beer, and, and Texas barbecue, right? Love it's it. The same thing, right? <laughs> well, I can't remember when, maybe four or five, maybe 10 years ago, a lot of people started getting sick eating ice cream, right? Mm. And they came to figure out there was like a, there was a factory that had um, some like Listeria, something like some kind of, some of those in the factories, right? Remember correctly, this Bluebell CEO closed, we called all the ice cream. And hopefully I, this is true. Hope I don't make it up. They recalled all the ice cream from all the factories that closed all the factories, right? And like, like spent like a week cleaning up, right? Hmm. So I remember that. This is part of my head too, right? Somebody did the right thing. Sounds like a very, very proactive strategy. Yeah. Proactive. I don't know the details, and I will definitely make a note of reading up this story, because we have a website where we covering news stories. So I'll definitely cover it. Thank you for sharing that with me. If the CEO reacted fast, one of the principles is act with lightning yeah. speed. If the CEO reacted with fast, responded in some way to address consumers' hurt, apology, or publishing a new an interview that we are looking into it, or something of that sort, which shows sincere contrition on the part of the CEO, then he closed the factory and then he fixed the problem. Kudos to him. Well, well, I mean, it's not funny, but like it's kind of funny. Bluebell was such a good brand equity. People like. I don't care what does get me sick. I'm still going to eat it, right? Still, yeah, yeah. That's a strong brand. This is so good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll still eat it, right? <laughs> That's what the strong brand is all about. Yeah. I'm sure some people are, the people who are still eating Blue Bluebell ice cream, even though they knew. Oh, they're like, oh, that's Longview, That's Texas. exactly I'm right. Gonna know, I'm going to know El Paso, Texas, you yeah. know. I, I know when it comes to the same factory. Yeah, they might have rationalized that I don't think there's any problem with what I'm consuming. And there is this very well-known psychological principle, this can't happen to me. Yeah. There is a self-positivity bias that we have. It happens out of nine, it happens in nine percent of people. Yeah. To me. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. But some people maybe in that segment who thought it won't happen to me. Yeah. So they continued eating that ice cream. Even the Tylenol, uh, when Tylenol's the Tylenol scare came about, before the scare, it had 37% share. After the scare, the share fell to 8%, as you would expect. Yeah as you would expect. So my intuition, and I don't know the details, my hypothesis is of those 8%, some people were like what you're talking about. <clears throat> it can't happen to me. Maybe it was a one-off. Some or, people or, didn't, or they didn't know about or it. Or I don't live in Chicago. I don't live in Chicago. Or I don't live in that David or Chicago. That's exactly right. It, it it happened in Chicago. I live in, you know, Nashville. It doesn't yeah. happen to me. Or, uh, you know, they didn't know about it. Many people are not aware of it. It's before the internet, right? That's right. So you told me about this ice cream yeah. thing. If I had gone to Texas, I wouldn't have known. Yeah. So there's an awareness issue. There is a denial issue or there's a self-positivity. This can't happen to me. And there's a strong brand, which oftentimes serves as a cushion. So I'm going to pull something real fast. And see what it is. That's right. So I have your uh, eight principles up right. here on the screen. Right. Can you like go through these sure. however you want to do it? Yes, sure. Thank you for this opportunity, Jason. So do the right thing I spoke about, that the first response we want people to have, brands should have is, 
to be salient, to be mindful that how can I address the pain of the victim who has been affected by the transgression, whether it is real, whether it is perceived, whether it is of your own accord or not. So the, quick, quick question. Like, how do you, do you have to decide like the rank order of these? Well, we do the right thing was an easy one yeah, because yeah. that pretty much spelt out the roadmap. After that, I don't, the brand authenticity one and the last three or four, the three last three were more long-term as we saw long-term. The first three or four were more, you need to respond now and do something now. Take accountability, act with lightning speed, communicate transparently and choose principle over profit. Maybe choose principle over profit is also a mindset change that needs to happen. But we really looked at what you need to do immediately versus what you need to build into the DNA of the corporation. So take accountability is not saying we are responsible. Take accountability is giving closure to the world that we will do something about it, even if it is not our fault. That is very important. Sometimes we say it's not our fault and the problem be damned. Probably that's okay, but you are running the risk of the brand running into some rough weather because somebody else will take the narrative away. So that's take accountability. Act with lightning speed in a similar breath. The longer you wait, the longer the narrative has gone out of your control. Like said, even a day is too long. Even now. a day is too long nowadays. Especially if you're, you're a worldwide company because it's, you know, <laughs> nine to five here, nine to five somewhere else. That's right. That's exactly right. The world is becoming uh, one. You're right. Time zones. The second what happens in the U.S. instantaneously, people in China, India, everybody knows what's going on. Communicate transparently. And the reason we are talking about this is because I'm, I'm sure some people will push back and say, why don't we give it a spin? Or why don't we give it a slant and stuff like that? I can understand the economic or the rational logic behind it, but uh, communicating transparently in our understanding will minimize the need for cover-ups later, number one. Number two, sooner or later, the truth will come out. That's the world we are living in, sooner or later. The CEO of Volkswagen denied knowing about the emissions cheating device until New York Times found an email and published it, That's, that he knew about it. Yeah, the New York Times doing that is not a good thing for your brand. It's not a good thing for your brand. So these are telltale signs that you cannot hide. And today we don't think transparency is negotiable. We'd say that. We are living in a world of digital democracy, you know? Then choose principle over profit, and profit will follow. Let's read this principle that way. If you put pr profit over principle, it sounds like a no-brainer, but we need to stress this. Look at these principles, then say, yes, profit will come. And sometimes, if there is a problem, taking a hit is probably going to be the logical expectation. You know, you cannot avoid taking a hit. The, the question is, how do you address taking that hit? The sixth is treat each life with dignity. We talk about this because many times corporations will do a very you know, clinical calculus. What is the cost? What is the benefit of a human life? And they say, okay, even if we have to give so much money to this human life, which is hurt, we'll get out of it. Unfortunately, that's not how the world works today, unfortunately. And you cannot disrespect human life today. George Floyd's murder that happened in, in Minnesota, it became wildfire across the world within hours, within hours, right? And as much as the presumed perpetrators tried to you know, give a different story or spin it or whatever, the, you know, the water had reached, yeah, you know, it's on film. They had, they, that's they exactly right. Like, Somebody had recorded the whole episode. And so you, when we indignify life and we spin a story, that is not part of our playbook at all. So we talk about Dolce and Gabbana releasing those ads in China, where a male voiceover is telling a beautiful Chinese woman how to eat Italian food with chopsticks. And she is not doing it well. So many people saw that as misogynistic, as sexist, as Italians know it better than Chinese, the cultural problem, though that people saw as indignifying the Chinese consumer. Leadership sets the tone. You know, this sounds like a no-brainer. It's not rocket science, but we were so amazed to find that every, we've covered 25 cases in this book. Every case, the leader is at the center of the case, either because either the cause of the transgression or the solution to the transgression. There was no doubt it emerged that leader sets the tone. When the leader says, for instance, Muhlenberg in Boeing said that it was the airline at fault. It was the pilot who did not follow protocol. When it is published in the media, what is the Boeing employee thinking? 
this is the story that I'm supposed to share, yeah. right? That is what I'm supposed to say. So he set the tone. He set the tone by release by that interview. And we have lots of stories in the book where leaders and Starbucks, the yeah. leader flew to Philadelphia, leader apologized six times. The leader is saying to the whole corporation, this was not okay. And we need to apologize. And for I just thought it's not right. Like mm. when, when Boeing says airlines fault, right? Mm. What you didn't think about, I think it was like, you know, I, I'm the airline CEO. Mm -hmm. I heard him throw me on the bus like, what? Mm -hmm. I, I, I've, I've paid you millions of dollars of, of, on planes, right? And you can say it's my fault? Yeah, exactly. Like, are you kidding me right now? Yeah, yeah. Like, I'm, I'm about to go to Airbus. That's exactly right. The airline's reputation is being damaged. The pilot's reputation is being damaged. And for a second, when I read that interview, I was very confused. As an academic, we always entertain multiple hypotheses mm -hmm. for a phenomenon that we observe. One of the hypotheses was that there could have been a fault with the plane. There could be something else. Yes, protocol didn't, they didn't follow protocol. Then we said, why is Boeing blaming an airline? That's their customer. Yeah, that, I just thought that it doesn't no make sense. it doesn't make economic sense, right? So it was confusing for us until it came to be told that it, he was wrong, right? So leadership sets the tone. We covered this uh, shocking case in India of uh, a terrorist attack that took place at a hotel in India. The hotel is called Taj Mumbai. It was in the capital, in the commercial capital of India, Mumbai. There's a movie made on it, and a very nice movie. And uh, terrorists attacked the country, the the city, and they burnt half the hotel down. I think 166 people died. Hundreds were injured, and 10 of the hotel employees died. Most of them, following the leadership principle, customer is God. When we think about it for a moment, they were following their training. Leadership had set the tone and they gave their lives for it. They gave the ultimate sacrifice for it. So I know it's an extreme example, but we use that to say, this is what good leadership is all about. That you're every, at the, at the, in the whole hierarchy of your employee base, everybody knows what is good behavior with your stakeholders. Uh, you know, so leadership sets the tone. And we think that Boeing has seen three leaders because they haven't found the sweet spot, the right leader who can take care of the situation. In Nestle, Maggie's case that I talked about, they didn't change the leader, but they had four leaders from different countries that converged on India to solve the problem that Maggie was having. The CEO of Nestle Worldwide, the Sri Lanka CEO, the India CEO, and I forget, there were four CEOs, who were all bunched up in a, in a room and saying, how do we crack this problem? Because the leader has to ultimately make the call, right? Very important principle from an HR perspective. And then build brand authenticity. What we talk about in the book is, Jason, that a brand is authentic where it owns its behavior, regardless, you know, regardless, right? So you make a promise to your consumer, you fulfill it obsessively. Obsessively is the word. And when you make a mistake, you own it, you take ownership and say, I'm going to fix it. That is what authenticity is in our, in our opinion. And the case, the two brands that bring a smile to our face, which we think are really authentic brands, are strong leadership-based brands. One is Patagonia and one is Ben & Jerry's. Yeah, yeah. Now, Ben & Jerry's as a brand probably you know, trigger some people because they have taken very strong. Yeah, they can be perceived like too liberal. Too, that's like exactly, too that's exactly. Eco-friendly, too exactly. environmental. Yeah, and we completely understand if the people who are on the opposite side of the spectrum don't appreciate this example, we totally understand. The point that we are making is not that you have to be too liberal. That's not the point we are making. The point we are making is they have taken a role, they have taken a stance and they are executing it Till the cows come home. No compromise about it, right? Even if it hurts them, even if there are calls for boycotts from the conservative end of the spectrum, they, are, they say, this is what we believe in. So every single segment of society, howsoever marginalized, matters to Ben and Jerry's, right? Every single segment. Patagonia's case is remarkable because it teaches even entrepreneurs that this principle roadbook, roadmap is not for big corporations. The founder of the corporation was this guy called Schoenard, Mr. Schoenard. And he started out by creating mountaineering equipment. And he was very sad that the equipment was damaging the rocks. And that was his motivation to create a corporation which minimizes the uh, damage to the earth. 
and everything that the corporation does, and we covered a lot of its activities, is deeply resonant of this idea. Whatever we do, we have to create a sustainable footprint for people to follow, even if it costs us a lot, even if it costs us a lot. So they switched from traditional cotton to organic cotton some years back, even though it, it hit their profit. They said no compromise. They actually went in public saying, don't buy this jacket, Patagonia, yeah. right? You might have heard of that. Yeah, yeah. And it wasn't, a, it wasn't an advertising strategy. They really meant buy recycled product. We want you to buy recycled product because recycling saves the planet. We don't want you to buy this jacket authentically. They, they, I think they stopped Black Friday sales at one point in time. They stopped Black Friday sales. Uh, and I know REI, local REI, has also gone against yeah. Black Friday. So brand authenticity really is, you know, living up with your vision and mission relentlessly, relentlessly. And we, we share examples where these brands have done good for everybody that we know of, even at the cost to the brand, and they have yet prospered. We say in the book again and again, we are not anti-profit. We are totally for profit. You need profit for creating competitive advantage, for innovation, for you know, R&D, for changing your brand, your product, whatever it is to become, stay up, up with the times. We, you need money. But what we are saying is that should not be our obsessive pursuit. The profit should be a me, should be an, not the only end you're seeking. That's what we are talking about. And if you follow these principles, it is a perfect win-win model for everybody. The victim wins, the presumed perpetrator wins, the planet wins, the stakeholders win, and we think it'll create a better planet for everybody. So who do y'all write this book for? For CEOs, for marketers, for regular people? Like who like, do you actually write that book for? We had uh, in our minds the chief, the CEOs, the C-suite executives, and the senior managers were the people we wanted to write this book for because they are at the center of all these transgressions, either, as I said, because they are at the center of the cause or at the center of the response, what effect it has. At the same time, and this, this sounds like I'm trying to pitch for the book, and yes, I am, because we believe in this book. We think uh, this book is a good read for most managers who are working with consumers, who are working with brands who are required to execute the strategies of the corporation at a micro level, who are facing the market, who are facing the distributors, who are facing the competition, who are facing the regulators on a day-to-day -day basis. We think it'll help them understand exactly what we are trying to say. And so how are you making sure the right people are reading your book? Uh, well, through these podcasts, partly, you know, we are not going on podcasts where fiction is, yeah. you know, talked about, for instance. We are being very... Uh, selective, you know, we want to reach the right target audiences. And we have published some articles in the business press, not in mainline press. And we have sent copies of these of this book to some of the CEOs that we were able to get addresses of in the world. Most of them are in US and India. Some of them are in Europe. We are scouting for CEOs in other parts of the world. That's what we are trying to do. So what is our goal for the book? Is it like, get it, sell us a number of, 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 of uh copies? Is it like decrease transgressions in the business war by a certain percent? Like what? The goal for this book is how can we create a playbook which helps literally the planet become better through minimizing transgressions or and responding to them in a better way. Those are the two mechanisms we want to use to help the planet become a better place for everybody. We are not against brands, corporations. I do brand strategy. I was in corporations in my past lifetime. We want brands to be successful. We think there's a way to be successful, what, either minimizing your mistakes or knowing how to respond to those mistakes in a more constructive, empathic, and everybody wins way. And the book was just recently released like- One and a half months back. Okay. Yeah. Is there a plan to like, do like a follow-up book on it? Not yet. We are thinking of another topic right okay. now. Uh, we do think that there is a possibility of a follow-up book, but we don't have a clear idea. You know, like uh, I recently learned that um, uh, there are two, the movies which have been made, movie one, movie two, I forget the name of the movie. Oh yeah, um, I, I, it'll come to me. Now the producer and the director have created the third movie, they've got the plot. It's all organically coming, right? So that set me thinking, what is an organic way to extend this book? You know, we don't want to write another book 
just because there is content. Yeah. You know, we want to have a purpose, a mission, and a value creating endeavor. And frankly, writing a book is is uh, challenging. And this is your first book. This is our first book. Uh, our daughter wrote the first book in the family, by the way, when they were 16 years old. So this is a, a mom and dad following their footsteps. So we do want to write a book, but we want to find the right spot which we have passion for. And we believe we can make a contribution both informationally and emotionally. Was there a big difference between writing a book and writing, like say, like an academic article? Preference? Yes, there's a huge difference. Huge difference I think there's a huge difference. The research is still the same. Uh, the article requires a certain structure. The article has different moving parts. It touches upon usually a very small problem that the world wants the answers to. While in a book, you have, I think, a broader canvas. And the book goes through a very different review process. Uh, it does not go through the classic, you know, rigorous journal review process. But our book went through review process with managers, the first draft. Then we reviewed the book again and again, my wife and I. As I said, hundreds of drafts were written. And we caught lots of mistakes. Then we sent it to a few friends who commented on it. So they're different. I think they're different animals. A book is different. An article is different. And how long did it take you to, to write the book from like idea to like publication? This book took us a little over two years. Okay. Uh, though if you include publication, because the last uh, few months took almost a year before we were we published it. So from start to finish, it took three years for us. Uh, yeah, that's the answer to your question. And from literally from idea to publication. So I found this somewhere. I, don't, I can't remember where, but it says, "Decided by Business Week as a four-star teacher." Shelley has received 25 teaching awards and citations. Can you talk, can you like brag on yourself a little bit about that? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I, I've been really fortunate that I've had some terrific students. And uh, I think uh, I've learned, as I shared with you, that I never assume one student is better than the other. That's one. The second thing is that my mentor, I have a mentor. He passed away. His name is Daisaku Ikeda. He's a Japanese philosopher, poet. Uh, I learned from his writings. And one of the things he taught me was human dignity. And he taught me about the role of a teacher in the life of a student. And that deeply impacted me. What he said was that the student is looking to the teacher for changing their lives for the better, rather than just delivering content. You know, That changed the way I approach each class. So I go into the class saying, how can I give them today something that I know which will help them, number one. And number two, I treat each student with as much respect, love, kindness, and dignity as the other student. And, you know, there are some other mechanisms that I follow, Jason. For instance, I stay in touch with many of my students way after they've graduated, way after they graduated. And I follow their success. If they ask, I give them my, you know, two cents worth, how they can solve through problems. And uh, that those are some of the ways that I approach teaching. Teaching for me is, uh, sorry if I'm saying this in a weird way, it's religious. It's very, very serious, you know. I can go and wing it, and students may not even learn, but the question then comes to my mind, am I happy doing that? I'm miserable doing that. I really need to go into the class and come out really exhausted that I give, give everything I had. So, Shelley, what would it take for a company to hire your way to be a professor? What would a corporate <laughs> have to offer you? I'm sorry, that's a very difficult question. I would love to talk to them about what we know, what we learn. And uh, that's really what I'm hoping to do, that some corporations will find our lessons worth bringing to their boardrooms, to their managers. We would love to talk to them. Uh, of course, you know, there might be some monetary incentive there, but our heartfelt reason is because we think we have a story to tell. We think we can help. We think we can contribute to the world becoming a better place. All right, follow-up question. What would another college have to do to hire you away from the University of Washington? <laughs> I'm quite happy, <laughs> Jason. I'm very happy where I am. Uh, always open to talking to colleges, but my school has been incredibly kind to me and my university has given me a canvas. All this has happened because I'm at UW, frankly, frankly. But, you know, colleagues, we are colleagues for each other. And sometimes universities say, hey, we got something better to offer you. We've got a center for you. We've got this for you. We've got that for you. And you talk to them, you listen to them respectfully, kindly and lovingly and see if it makes a difference. My wife and I both have jobs here. She's at UW Tacoma, I'm at UW Seattle. Okay. So we are a pair, we come as a pair, so to speak. Yeah. And again, UW has been kind, you know. They saw value in us, they gave us that opportunity. 
and we it's are hard to find nowadays, unfortunately. Huh? That's hard to find nowadays. It's very hard. It's very hard, and we have incre- in, infinite gratitude to UW for giving us this opportunity. Our finances are great. Our daughter is doing well at NYU. They're at NYU. Our lives are fine. What is, what is she studying at NYU? My, our daughter, her, their name is Naira. They are at Tisch School of Arts, okay. which is a theater and film school, very well reputed yeah. theater and film school. If I may brag a little for them, you know, people like Lady Gaga then came from Tisch, Oliver Stone came from Tisch. So it's a very famous school. It's considered to be one of the top schools in the US for sure. They are in the senior year and they want to direct plays on Broadway. That's their dream. Uh, any upcoming trips to India planned? Yes, we are going to India in December. My wife's parents are in their 90s, as I mentioned. We want to spend some time with them. Touch wood, their health is great. We are very happy. Their health is great. And, you know, they are, uh, they, we talk to them every day. Uh, they have strong voices. You know, my father-in-law is a real good friend of mine. I think of him as my dear friend. Uh, we talk to them every day. So we want to spend some time with them because it's come January, our little jobs will start, you know, teaching will start and all that. So we, we will be going to India in December. So like if someone wants to come to Seattle, you'll probably come and tell them, maybe don't come in January, right? Yeah. Maybe pick another <laughs> month. Is there like a, a, a like the best month to go to India for a visit? Uh, yeah, depending on which part of the country you're going in, I think December, January, February are good months to go to the north because it's not, it's kind of cool. Sometimes it's cold. It's not hot. During, as come April, May, June, July, August, the north becomes really hot. You're talking about temperatures touching, you know, 100 degrees Fahrenheit and more, pretty routinely, not for five days, but sometimes for a whole month. Yeah. And uh, we have got used to Seattle weather. And for us, going in summer becomes... Uh, we need to think about it. <laughs> so winter is great. And then also because we we are we are working during winter season, yeah. January, February, March, not easy for us to go. But summer we can go sometimes, but we haven't been to India in summer for a very long time. So is anything I should have asked you that I didn't or anything else you want to talk about? Oh, no, you've asked me so much. I'm just incredibly grateful, excited, and happy about our conversation, Jason. Uh, we, I feel fortunate. I'll be sure to share my experience with your wife that you called us. Yeah. And you called us in person, you're in Seattle. So the hike was literally 25 miles. Uh, I've never done a f- in-person podcast. I kind of really enjoyed it. It's like, just the connection is better, right? An amazing connection, yeah. amazing. You know, we're t- seeing eye to eye. Yeah. We're talking to each other. I can see your reactions in real time. Yeah. And uh, I'm kind of sort of, uh, you know, more on alert, you know, yeah. so to speak. Because yeah, you're, 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 you get distracted. You that's right, up, that's right. Those things, you know. Um, and I, I thank you that because of this, I didn't pick my phone up. <laughs> Otherwise, every five minutes, I feel like picking my phone up. Yeah. So, Shiala, can you share your social media so, or ways for people to reach out to you? Absolutely. So, uh, I have um, uh, I think you received the press yeah. kit. All the details are in the press kit. Okay. We are on LinkedIn. And there are several book, there are several online platforms where the book is being sold. Amazon.com, Barnes & Noble, and several others. And uh, yeah, the LinkedIn profile, we have a website for the book which is called brandtransgressions.com, brand transgressions. We would love to interact with people on that website. We hope they will write to us. We will personally respond to each email. That's our goal, you know, unless it becomes hard. And we let's see if it happens. We would love for them to respond. Please challenge the notions we've talked about, you know, find fault with it, criticize, say whatever you want to say. We would love to hear. Because for us also, it's a learning process. We've done as much research as we did over two years, but I'm sure, like you said, Bluebell ice cream, I hadn't heard of it. I'm sure some people will come with more examples. Yeah. If they have examples to share from their countries, we would love to read about them because we might write about those examples. And we would be sure to give credit to every respondent who writes to us. Shelly, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. And thank to you. our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.